tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following story is taken from the first chapter of the book, Smithlin, by author Kyle Dorsey, now available for purchase on Amazon.com. For more information on the book, Smithlin, or to purchase a copy, click the links in the video description below, if you dare. <laughs> Bob the Butcher by Kyle Dorsey Narrated by Matt Grant Recently, my girlfriend Brooklyn and I decided to move into our first house. It was a small house with one bedroom and one bathroom, but for our first house, it would suffice. The neighborhood we moved to was far off from the city we both grew up in. We both had this strong interest for nature and travel. So we moved to a small town called Smithland, which is buried in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. The residents of this small town seem friendly, but are very quiet and keep to themselves. Even the real estate woman, whom you'd expect to be bubbly and cheerful, was extremely quiet, with what appeared to be a fearful expression on her face. We decided to pass it off and assume that she was just a shy person. After about a month, we had finally settled in and began restoration on the house. We mainly did yard work, being that we didn't really have the money for any major restorations. One day, while cleaning weeds out of the garden, I happened upon a manhole cover. Huh. I found this a bit strange, considering the location of the house. It seemed like there should be no access to the sewer from here. Curious, I retrieved a crowbar from the shed and pried open the cover. I peered inside, only to find total darkness, and a few rungs at the beginning of a ladder. I continued down, my interest peaked at the thought of what I might find. I felt my foot hit the ground as I reached the end of the ladder. I fumbled through my pockets for a lighter, flicked the top and began inspecting the room. Each wall was decorated with a vast assortment of knives. In the middle of the room sat a desk with a sharpener and a clown mask atop it. The mask was different from other masks I had seen in many ways. The texture had me curious as to what it might be made out of. To hold the mask in place, two leather straps ran along the back and connected to the sides. I placed the mask back onto the desk and continued my inspection. At the side of the desk sat a large box which was covered in dust. I swiped the dust away with my fingertips and drew the flaps away from the box. Inside, I found an old film projector and one reel of film. Hmm, I thought to myself, what kind of past this house must have and what clues the film might provide. And I decided to retrieve it, bringing it into the house. I drew the shades and dimmed the lights, then started the projector and began the film. The film was grainy, but based on the attire and apparel of the people in the film, this must have been recorded around the 90s. It appeared to be a child's birthday in the film, a man and a woman were shown smiling and holding each other while watching as whom I could only assume were their child and friends were being entertained by a clown. 
The makeup the clown wore had strikingly similar designs to the mask that I had found. The film cut out and I began to rise from my chair. Suddenly and unexpectedly, the film recollected and continued on. In this part of the film, only the woman was shown. She didn't smile this time. She only stared blankly as her son and what appeared to be only half of the children from the original section of the film were entertained by the same clown. Suddenly, the group turned toward the camera, staring at something behind it with looks of fear and loathing. A man stepped on camera who had similar characteristics to the man in the first film, but somehow different. This time, darkness and evil radiated off of him. His muscles were toned in an almost sickly manner. I watched as the children ran over to the mother as he screamed and shouted at the group. I could see the mother weep and mouth what appeared to be, Robert, no! This appeared to enrage him in an almost terrifying manner. He screamed and flipped a table, almost flinging it across the yard. Next, he approached the clown, grabbing him by the throat and flinging him to the ground. He removed a marker from his pocket and then started drawing lines along the outer parts of his face. Then, he removed a sharp knife from his pocket, slowly and steadily began cutting through the flesh like paper. I wondered what I found more disturbing, the act or how precise his cuts were. The man stopped. He rose slowly and turned around. I vomited as I saw his face, for now I knew what the mask I had found was made from. The man stood facing the group. The clown's face stretched over his like a mask. He gazed for a few moments at them with a sadistic look in his eyes. <laughs> Bob, I've decided to call him Bob, marked his final atrocious act in the film by drawing a gun from his waist, and then shot each of the guests dead, one by one. I vomited once more as the film cut out. I was shocked not only by what I had seen, but also upon the realization that it had happened in my own backyard. I decided not to tell Brooklyn. I couldn't corrupt this house for her as the film had for me. Hours had passed, and the visions of what I had seen had still not left my mind. I had finished my work and gone to bed, completely restless. Brooklyn returned home and found me awake. She had been putting in extra hours at work, which had caused her to return later at night. Why are you still awake, hon? She asked, confused. All that I could do was kiss her head as she crawled into bed with me and pray that holding my love in my arms would comfort me. It was 3 a.m. I hadn't slept at all. Brooklyn was sound asleep. God, how I envied her. I rose out of bed and looked out the window. Raindrops were heavily falling and lightning flashed across the sky. A storm had rolled in about a half an hour ago. I walked to the window and watched the raindrops fall, splashing against the concrete streets and waves. I felt myself finally relax as I listened to the sound of the rain patter against the window. 
I let my eyes sink at the thought that I might finally get some rest tonight. My heart stopped as my eyes reached street level. There, on the other side of the street, stood the dark figure of a man looking back at me. I couldn't see his face, but I knew it was him by the same chill he gave me when I saw the film. I stared for what felt like hours, until I saw him draw something silver from his waist. I squinted to get a better look. It was a gun. Before I had time to react, I heard a loud bang followed by an echo, and I saw the flash in the chamber of the gun. I winced, waiting for the bullet to make impact, but it never did. It was a blank. He was toying with me. I looked back at the street only to find that he was gone. I crawled into bed and wrapped my arms around Brooklyn, fearful for both of our lives. The next morning I awoke to the sound of Brooklyn cooking breakfast in the kitchen. I looked at the clock. It was 8 a.m. I hadn't fallen asleep until 5 a.m. I'd have to go through the day on only three hours of rest. I dragged myself out of bed and stumbled down the hallway, still trying to wake up. I made it to the kitchen where I sat down, hazily rubbed the sleep from my eyes, and tried to greet Brooklyn with a smile. Her face remained emotionless. Concern radiated from her as she made her way around the kitchen. She scraped the eggs she had been cooking onto my plate, then sat down next to me, staring at me with a stern yet worrisome expression. What happened last night, Daniel? She asked with a choke in her voice. <laughs> what do you mean? I asked as innocently as I could. You were still awake when I got home. You were pale as a ghost. You hardly slept. You looked terrified. You still do. Her eyes watered as she spoke. She was pained. I felt guilty keeping such a dark secret from such a sweet girl. It's nothing. I'm just not settled in yet. All the new people, the new sights, this house. I'll be okay. I promise. I prayed that she wouldn't see through my lie. I couldn't have her as terrified as I am. Not after she'd been so happy since we moved here. Okay. If you need to talk, you know I'm always here, babe. She pressed her soft lips against my cheek and then walked away. <sighs> I sighed, both in relief and discontent, at how I couldn't convince myself to tell her what I knew. I finished my breakfast and went to the yard to continue restoration on the house while Brooklyn left for work. I spent the entire day drowning in paranoia, always watching over my shoulder, knowing he was somewhere nearby. I'd watch carefully as I mowed the lawn, raked the leaves, and continued removing weeds from the yard, wondering where he could be hiding. I spent hours working out in the hot sun. As soon as I'd finish one project, I'd start on the next. I needed anything that could keep me active and alert with a good eye in my surroundings. That way, no matter what his next move was, at least I'd see him coming. By the time Brooklyn had returned home, I was exhausted. My arms, neck and face were beet red and burnt from the sun. I could hardly walk. She helped me to the bedroom, and we both went to bed. I laid awake, waiting for her to fall asleep, waiting for a chance to go back to guard duty to see if I could scope out Bob the Butcher. My night's work turned out fruitless, and I spent the next few days with the same routine. I'd get between two and three hours of sleep each night after keeping watch. I took his lack of activity as a sign that he was gone, and I thought to myself, if he wanted to harm us, you would have surely done it by now. 
After the first couple of days, I started feeling the toll my paranoia had put on my mind. I had begun losing touch with the world around me, and nothing made sense anymore. I heard voices that came from nowhere. I saw shadows that weren't there. I needed to see a doctor, but I convinced myself that I just needed rest. It had been two weeks with no signs of Bob the Butcher. I had made a full recovery, and I could finally hold Brooklyn and feel comfort again. One night after finishing my hard work, I decided to relax with some TV. Brooklyn was at work, so I was home alone again. The show I was watching was some documentary about the world's worst serial killers. <laughs> I thought to myself, they can't even compare to Bob, and found myself laughing, feeling that it was all behind me. I also thought to myself about whether or not the history of our house was the reason so many of our neighbors had kept to themselves. I looked out the window. Lightning flashed across the sky and thunder shook the house. Then I heard the loud click as the power cut out. Before my encounter, I used to always enjoy storms like this. I did my best to remain calm, but a thought grew in my mind that reminded me that if he was still here, without television, without radio, without anything to distract me, it would be just he and I. I rushed to the front door and locked it, though this was not enough to make me feel secure. I hurried to the kitchen to grab the biggest knife I could find, and then sat tensely at the kitchen table. I sat for hours, the storm not dying down, and I had fallen asleep. My eyes creaked open about four hours later, and I looked at the clock, 11.53 p.m. Brooklyn should have been home by now. Before I had the chance to rise up from the table to see if she was home, I heard a sound that made my heart race and sent a chill down my spine. It was the sound of something sharp and metallic being driven across the side of the house, almost as if someone was cutting it with a knife. It ran the course of the house, beginning from the back and tracing to the front door, where it stopped. For at least 30 seconds, there was dead silence. Then, there were three slow, light knocks. I rose up from the table slowly, bracing the knife in my hand for attack. The knocks repeated, growing louder each time, as if whoever was on the other side of the door was losing their patience. There was one final loud thud, then a crash. Whoever was there broke through the door. Heavy footsteps echoed down the hallway, approaching the kitchen. Terrified, I ran around the house, looking for another outlet, scurrying about like a trapped rat. I dashed through the doorway to the living room, only to be struck abruptly by a heavy, brick-like fist. Large enough to make an impact from the top of my skull to the tip of my chin. I fell back in a daze and looked up at my attacker. Lightning flashed, revealing his painted, grinning face. He wore a ragged tank top, old, worn out jeans, the clown mask from the bunker, and the same twisted look he had in the film. In his hand, he held a disembodied head, which was still dripping with blood. Whose? I could not tell. Or at least not until he rolled it to me. He swung one arm up, flinging the head towards me lightly, sending it bouncing, and then rolling to my side. 
It stopped with the eye staring directly into mine. <gasps> it was Brooklyn. She held a disturbed, pained look on her face. The same she may have held in her passing. I choked, nearly starting to cry at the sight of my lost love. Then looked back at him. He stood there, looking into my eyes with a vulgar presence of evil. <laughs> and finally spoke with a thick, gravelly voice. You should have told her. She was right. If I'd only told her, she might still be alive. It had been my fault. Before I could have a second thought, he kicked me flat to the ground, stepping on my chest so that I couldn't move. He leaned in close to my face, breathing heavily, and then with a chilling voice spoke. You were the lucky one. You knew that I was coming for you. Next time, you won't be as fortunate. He took the same night that I had seen in the film from a holster that was strapped to his waist, then grabbed me tightly by the throat, strangling me and forcing my tongue out of my mouth. With one clean swipe by the blade, my tongue flew from my mouth, flopping to the ground. Blood oozed out like a waterfall and I screamed at the intense pain that I felt. He leaned in close again. You won't be able to yell for help, he said, then threw the knife to the side. Next, he drew out two smaller flat-handled knives, which he placed between his fingers as he made a fist. He struck my face with the force of a speeding car, the blades piercing my eyes. You won't be able to see me coming. I could hear him say. I choked on my own blood, vomiting back up the amount that I had swallowed. I couldn't see, but I knew he was still there. He leaned forward. I could feel his breath circulating throughout my ear. You won't be able to hear me coming, he said before jamming what felt like two metal rods into my ears, rupturing both of my eardrums. Uh, I lay there, praying that he would finish me off, only to feel discontent as I felt the vibrations of his footsteps going away from heavy to light. He was leaving. I groaned, knowing that my pain was not over. Now, I lay here in a puddle of my own blood. I can hardly move, but I tell myself, if I can just find Brooklyn's body, I can fix her. I stumble, trying to balance myself as I pull up off the floor. All that I need to do is find her body. I can fix her. Things will be normal again. I will hold her again. Bob the Butcher is taken from the first chapter of the book Smithlin by author Kyle Dorsey. Now available for purchase on Amazon.com. For more information on the book Smithlin or to purchase a copy, click the links in the video description below. If you dare. <laughs> Entry 1 To encourage the patients to keep up on their journals, Dr. Bryant has encouraged the rest of the staff assigned to this ward to keep a journal as well openly. It's not too much of a trial and, 
if it'll encourage these patients to monitor their mental states and open up about the shared trauma they experienced, I suppose taking a few minutes out of my day to write is worth it. I am one of the nurses assigned to what we're calling the Enigmatic Hall. Enigmatic, of course, is the company responsible for the chemical spill at the campground that poisoned all these people out enjoying summer vacation. At least, it wasn't on a bumper weekend like 4th of July or Memorial Day, but everyone in the area had to be taken here. Whatever was in that truck was potent, so even if they feel fine, they'll have to be monitored for weeks, if not months. Luckily for them, Enigmatic is footing the bill for all the care costs. I imagine they'd get sued to high heaven if they didn't, though. Around 20 patients require minimal care, showing no symptoms or signs that anything is the problem. They're not going to be typically under my supervision. Those poor souls need intense care to help them recover. Or potentially, just to provide care measures so they're not in agony during their final days. Unfortunately, a few were right at Site Zero where it happened. They're all in clean rooms. I hope that they'll all get to go home soon. For their sake, of course. How can I complain about my own life when it could be so much worse? Entry 2 I've started to get to know everyone. The troublemakers, of course, stick out the most. Yep, I feel awful for laughing. But one of the worst patients is named Karen. And she acts exactly how you'd expect. She was on vacation with her husband Barry and two sons, one of which is a college student and the other is still in high school. And the way she's acting, she wants to be treated like she's at some high-class resort. I am just waiting for her to ask to speak to the manager. Still, I'm not overly affected by it as much as she complains. I used to work retail. I'm used to her type. And if there was a time to be a Karen, this might be it. I hate to admit being scared of a few of them, but one of the men frightens me, Elijah. I might be a bit naive, but I know what prison tattoos look like, and he has several on his arms and one on his neck. The one on his neck looks like a snake. He's loud, and he hasn't tried anything yet, but I still find myself shaking a little when I hand him his daily antibiotics and medication. At least he doesn't have any swastikas or other racist symbolism on him, at least not as far as I can tell. There might be some other tattoos hidden under his shirt. There's one patient I am getting along with, though, Kyra. We have a lot in common. It turns out we attended the same college simultaneously. Although we never shared classes, we probably bumped into each other in the past. She's so sweet, and she's doing her best to stay strong. Sadly, this trip was put on by her friends and twin sister. It was to cheer her up after her fiancé just dumped her out of nowhere. She asked me to check in on her sister Myra if I ever got put on shift there. I promised I would, although I don't think I'll be working there anytime soon. Enigmatic has hired many specialists to help care for the ones most affected by the chemical spill. She's the only one of them not in intensive care after the incident. Probably for the best. They know what they were carrying after all, and that means they probably know the best ways to counteract the effects. I still might try to slip in there, though just to check on Kyra's friends so I can soothe her worries. The worst part is always not knowing. Entry 3 I feel bad for judging Elijah off the bat. He's hilarious. It started with Karen loudly accusing Elijah of looking at her, <clears throat> ahem, her behind. Not the word she used, but you can guess what word she used. Elijah was hardly bothered and told her she was not his type, quite frankly. He proceeded to flip his hand downward and wink at her husband, who laughed so hard I thought he was going to choke. Karen sputtered, turned a shade of red I didn't think was humanly possible, and then proceeded to throw her cup of peaches at him. Elijah was fine, but Karen is restricted to her room for the day and apologizes to Elijah once she cools off. I got him a new shirt and confirmed that none of his tattoos were race-coded, at least as far as I know. I had a good time talking with him. He said he was bi, but the bitch wouldn't know the difference anyway. So he decided to mess with her for a bit of fun. He apologized to me for causing a fuss, even though she was the one starting things. Not a bad guy, Elijah. I've tried getting into intensive care, but I've not had the time. Not to mention the one time I did try entering, I was practically shooed away from the door. I was told I'd need approval 
from Dr. Bryant if I wanted to see any of the patients. Well, I doubt I'd be able to get that. I'll just have to be a little quicker next time. Entry 4 God, I don't know what to tell Kyra. I got into intensive care last night when there wasn't anyone watching the door. Each patient was kept in a separate glass room and... God, one of the men's legs looks charred down to the bone. Fourth degree burn barely cuts it. But they're not on bed rest. With how severe their injuries are, they shouldn't walk around. Maybe some shouldn't even be alive. I don't understand that. The man I mentioned was charred down to the bone. He was frantically pacing across the room, gnashing his teeth and dragging his fingers across his scalp. I could make out more prison-style tattoos on the skin of his biceps that weren't burnt. He didn't even seem to notice me pausing to stare, even when he looked directly at me with eyeballs that were bleached white. I believe he was blind. It was the only reason I could think of why he didn't react. None of the other patients looked better or were being treated as I think they should have been. Some of the burns weren't as bad, but their skin was bubbling and cracking in ways that should have been agonizing. But instead of being kept on an IV, they were walking around their glass cells, their eyes blank white looking right past me. It was haunting. I was almost thankful I got caught. Dr. Bryant bumped into me while I was staring in the glass room containing a woman that was absentmindedly pulling at her fingernails while staring at the ceiling. He only gave me a brief scolding, understanding my curiosity, but explaining that the other patients could not know about the condition of the ones at Site Zero. Mostly because, well, some of them don't have identities yet. And with the accounts they were told, there's one or two we simply don't have in either ward. Either they weren't at the campground when the incident happened, or worse. The catastrophic fallout destroyed their bodies. They were still exploring that site, and bone shards were found. He couldn't explain to me why they weren't acting like your average burn victims. The only hypothesis was the seriousness of the burns, along with the chemicals, destroyed their ability to feel pain. Their vitals were stable, each person was at almost no risk, but they didn't seem to respond to outside stimulus. It's like watching crispy zombies, still alive, but everything that made them a person is gone. I suppose the only thing I can do is lie. I hate the idea, but Kyra doesn't need to know that all that might be left of her twin sisters, pieces and parts scattered across the campground. No reason to confirm anything. Entry 5 A half lie is still a lie, but it's not as bad as a full lie. When Kyra caught up with me today, I told her that the patients were all stable, but there was a long road to any sort of recovery. I didn't specifically mention her sister, and thankfully she dropped the subject. We ended up putting a puzzle together with Elijah. A few pieces were missing, but that's how it goes with a puzzle anyone can use. I'm already starting to wear out, if I'm honest. Every day, Dr. Bryant has us give the patients a new battery of medications to prevent any side effects from the potential chemical exposure. I'm starting to wonder if they're worse off than they know. As a kid, I remember reading a book where a character drank a bottle of poison, and the only symptom was that they dropped dead after a few hours. Are my patients the walking dead? Entry 6 I got sick in the chapel today. I'm so, so embarrassed. So our hospital has a small, non-specific religious chapel that patients and family members are allowed to slip into so they can pray. I had a long day doing physicals for the patients, and although I'm not nearly the devout Catholic my mother thinks I am, I decided to take my break in the chapel. The moment I walked in there, I started to feel sick. I put it off to not having lunch and sat in the pew. I did notice the chapel was empty which was bizarre. There's usually one or two other people in there, quietly reading their religious books or having their heads bowed in prayer. But today, it was empty. I suppose it had to be empty sometimes as I took my seat. But the moment I bowed my head, my vision swam, and bile rose up in my throat. I swayed. I had to grab the pew in front of me to stop from sliding off. I closed my eyes to try to get a hold of myself and... Images flashed behind my shut eyelids. I saw eyes 
Lots of eyes. Hundreds, maybe even a thousand different eyes, all blinking at different times and all of them staring right at me. Right into me, even. My own eyes popped back open as my stomach groaned and I knew I was going to be sick. I tried to get out. I didn't want to barf in the chapel, but I only got as far as the nearest trash can before bending over and heaving into it. Tasting my packed lunch again was as pleasant an experience as you'd guess. According to the nurse that saw me exit the chapel, I was white as a sheet and looked ready to pass out. He thankfully had the time to help me, assisting me to the nearest bathroom to gargle some water and see if anything was wrong. Honestly, I was fine after a few minutes. A bit shaky, but okay. I didn't have a fever, and although my stomach still pitched and groaned, it settled down after I popped some Tums. I wasn't sick. I probably just need to throw out the deli turkey in my fridge. It's probably gone off, and that's why I threw up. It's a bit old, anyway. As for the eyes, well, you always see strange things when you close your eyes too tightly. The enigmatic ward can't afford to lose a nurse. At least I could finish the workday. Entry 7 Something's wrong here. It was a typical breakfast. Elijah wished me good morning, Kyra asked for an update on her sister, and Karen was kicking up a fuss again. One of my fellow nurses, Marilyn, tried to calm her down. Something about not having a gluten-free option for pancakes, even though she'd never asked for anything gluten-free up until then. Really, just a regular morning. Then I turned my back for one second, and all hell broke loose. I heard a crash and heard a body hit the floor. I spun around to see Marilyn on the ground, everything from her head to her shoulders covered in food. Karen wielded her tray like a weapon, shrieking in rage about how Marilyn called her a bitch for the last time. Karen brought her tray down on Marilyn's back, hitting her so hard the plastic tray cracked right down the middle. Karen just threw the shards away and started kicking Marilyn, screeching like a wild animal as Marilyn curled up in a ball to protect herself from the insane onslaught. Elijah reacted first, jumping out of his seat and grabbing Karen from behind. He dragged Karen away as she kicked and screamed. Barry reacted next, jumping in front of his wife as he tried to calm her down. I ran to Marilyn's side and helped her up. I yelled a code violet, and in seconds we had more than enough male nurses to handle Karen. Or so I thought. She had completely lost her mind. She screamed how we all kept calling her a bitch, that she just couldn't take it anymore and she fought like a devil. She ended up throwing Elijah over a table. How? I don't know. Elijah was over a foot taller than her and in a lot better shape. It took three nurses to hold her down. And it didn't matter they were shooting her with enough sedatives to put out a horse. She kept fighting. Somehow, this 5'2", 120-pound woman had found the unnatural strength to fight like that. After a hell of a fight, we got Karen strapped down to a gurney as she squalled and snapped her teeth at anyone who got too close. The blood vessels in her eyes had popped sometime during the fight, turning the whites almost crimson. She looked like a demon. No one has any serious injuries, at least. Marilyn had a cut on her forehead. Her back was bruised from where Karen had broken a tray over it. Elijah was banged up. Karen had bitten his arm while they were struggling, and one of the male nurses had a dislocated shoulder. I don't understand why Dr. Bryant insisted Karen be taken to the intensive care unit. She needed psychiatric help, but he was adamant. It's not the right call in this situation. I talked with Marilyn after she got patched up, and the strangest thing was that Marilyn admitted she was thinking about how much of a bitch Karen was being but she never said it out loud. She knew she didn't say it out loud. All nurses have had negative thoughts about a difficult patient. That's just human. She was better than that. We all are. It's just a strange day. Maybe Karen just snapped, and Marilyn just happened to be thinking that. My head hurts. I blame all of Karen's screaming. Entry 8. Things are getting stranger. I treated Elijah's bite wound right after Karen was taken away. It was pretty bad. Karen hadn't held back as she sunk her teeth into his skin. This morning, I came back in to clean the wound and change the bandages, and the bite's gone. I thought I had lost my mind, but Elijah was just as confused as I was. 
The bandage covering a nasty injury is perfectly healed, as if it had never happened. There's no sign of scabbing. There's a little dried blood and some strange green ooze that may be pus on the bandage itself. But the skin is perfectly healed. Even the hair's grown back. Enigmatic immediately had every sort of test run on Elijah. We took blood, saliva, and urine samples before running him through the MRI machine and taking x-rays. We haven't gotten back all the tests yet, but he's as healthy as a horse. He even admits that he feels perfectly fine, other than the confusion of how the hell he healed overnight. I have no answers for him. I wonder if Enigmatic has any. Kyra tried to get into intensive care. I managed to head her off and insist that she didn't want to see anything in there, but she was pretty upset with me. I don't blame her. As far as I've been aware, they still aren't sure if her sister is even in there. Not to mention I don't want her seeing Karen. God knows what's up with her. Entry 9. Barry is dead. Karen killed him. I don't know how the hell he got past security, much less how he got into her sealed glass room. But within the 10 minutes the nurses left Karen alone, Barry got to her, and in return, Karen ripped out Barty's throat with her teeth. She took a few more chunks out of him, too. She's not mentally well. She might have been a handful, but she cared for her husband. Half of the fuss she kicked up she did for Barry's sake. She loved him. Claims that this might be a side effect of the chemical exposure, so she has to stay in isolation, aren't doing anything for me. They're still keeping her in that damn intensive care. She needs help. Psychiatric help. Dr. Bryant assures me that they will have mental health professionals added to the roster, but I'm not sure if I believe him. I've never doubted him before. He's a successful doctor for a reason, but nothing about this seems right. I don't envy the person who had to tell Karen's and Barry's kids that their father is dead. And it's because he broke protocol to visit her. Entry 10. I saw my mom die of cancer when I was 13. She'd already come back from it once, so we thought she'd just do it again. But the relapse was far more aggressive than her initial bout with it. She faded away in months. My father was the one who insisted on a closed casket. Even though she was technically still whole, she barely resembled the person she was before the disease ravaged her body. It was like a punch to the gut when I gave one of the patients a physical and found a lump. Sky Monroe is a teacher. She's upbeat, a real go-getter. The worst part about being in isolation for her is that she can't go for her daily runs to burn off all this excess energy. But she didn't let it break her. She instead came up with fun games to play with the younger crowd and would push all the tables in the meal room to the side so the kids could play tag or play relay games with empty pill bottles. She'd made it to a hundred. She's a real trooper, the picture of perfect health. But this morning, during the physical, she mentioned that she felt something on her lower back while showering. Possibly a pimple, but she asked me to check. I did. It wasn't a pimple. It's a growth at the base of her spine about the size of my thumb. I don't know how it grew so quickly, but it's there. We're performing a biopsy, and I've assured her that it's likely benign, but that's a lie. This is likely the first we'll see of cancers resulting from the accidental chemical exposure. There are not that many people here. Not in the grand scheme of things. But they're still people. They had plans, life goals. Things that they told themselves they'd do later. Things they never got to do because they never had the courage. Now, whatever future they had planned, it's been ripped away from them. I look into the lounge room where someone put Bambi on the TV. Elijah and Kyra are playing checkers. They're laughing. Perhaps if they'd met anywhere else, they'd end up falling in love, getting married, and living long, happy lives together. The kids, the youngest one is barely nine. She wants to become president someday. She told me while I was taking her blood pressure a few days ago. The elderly couple, Robert and Agnes, should be celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary this year. I want to pray that they all get to have their dreams, that since we caught it early enough, we'll be able to head off any cancer or sickness. But every time I bow my head, I feel sick. The words catch in my throat like there's a hand around my neck strangling me to silence. I can't get anything to come out. 
so I just sit back up straight and try to tend to the patients the best I can. I don't want any of them to die. Please, if anything is listening, don't let them die. Entry 11. I'm going to lose my goddamn mind. Enigmatic is the one running the tests on the biopsied lump, and they aren't telling us anything. I want to scream. Sky is being patient, but I'm fucking not. This is insane. We should have the results by now. At least a yes or no on cancerous cells present. But nothing. No good news, no bad news. A woman is waiting to hear if her life is over, and they're just jerking us around like it means nothing. I'm this close to talking to someone above Dr. Bryant's head about this. This whole setup is starting to feel like bullshit. Patients having psychotic breaks, or not knowing that their sister is possibly dead, or being forced to wait and wait and wait to hear whether or not they have cancer. This is a mess. Maybe to them, it does mean nothing. Entry 12. I've copied all my previous entries into this new notebook. The journal keeping my thoughts will now only be telling the people above me what they want to hear. But just in case something happens, I need some sort of evidence. I believe the enigmatic personnel and Dr. Bryant have been reading my journal without my consent. I left it at my workstation. I didn't think that anyone would care. This morning, Dr. Bryant took me aside. Nothing he said I could take him to court over, but I don't take kindly to veiled threats about my future as a nurse if I don't just suck it up and pretend everything happening in the enigmatic ward is par for the course. Nothing here is right. Right now, I'm a fly on the web. They're keeping an eye on me now, but I won't back down so easily. I'm trying to get a hold of Skye's results, at least to give her an answer about the lump in her back. It's expanding and has a hard, grayish shell forming over the top of the skin. Maybe it is cancer, but maybe it's something worse. I'm not going to rest until I have the answers. Entry 13. Kyra knows. I finished my rounds when I was grabbed from behind and dragged into a broom closet. The door was slammed after me and I was cornered by both her and Elijah. I thought for a second she might tear my heart out with how angry she was. But how can I blame her? I lied to her. I didn't mention that her sister was potentially MIA, which she is now, officially. All the patients have been identified now, and none of them are Myra. I couldn't apologize enough. I felt horrible. But I was forgiven, only because they needed my help, though. Kyra managed to get into intensive care. She saw the patients, all burnt. Only now, their flesh, their skin, it's growing back. Their skin is still black, with a thick gray ooze dripping out of the worst injuries, but it's no longer the texture of charcoal. They're healing. Somehow they're healing, and I don't know what to say to that. They're still acting like there's nothing wrong with them, and Kyra even talked with one of the patients, a close friend of hers named Zoe. Zoe wasn't acting like herself. She claimed that Myra was safe because she was with Kyra, and she spoke of the one in the basement level. Zoe called her mother, said she was all of our mothers now and that she was trapped. When Kyra told me about mother, I swear the room tilted. I felt faint, dizzy. For a moment between blinks, I thought there were eyes. Eyes everywhere. On the walls, Kyra and Elijah, even sprouting from me, blinking, staring, all black eyes. Elijah caught me before I fell and asked me if I saw them too. The eyes. I'm not the only one seeing them. The patients have been seeing them for a long time now. Only, some don't go away when they manage to blink their vision clear. The eyes are on everyone, even people just working in this wing. For me, it's on the tips of my fingers, the palms of my hands. I'm trying to do everything I can to trigger my vision of the eyes again, but it's not happening. My hands look normal, they feel normal, but I know they're there. I need to find out more about Mother. It's up to me to find out. Entry 14. There's something in the basement. Elijah and Kyra were right. I didn't manage to get in. I was already too close to getting caught, 
but there's a door leading down to the basement. Until now, that was the way into the morgue, where the bodies stayed before their families came and got them. But I checked the paperwork. We shipped all our bodies out to other hospitals. We haven't taken any other bodies in. Officially, it's been closed for cleaning. It's been that way since the chemical spill happened, which I don't know was a chemical spill anymore. Elijah told me what he saw. A team of heavily armed men walking into the woods the evening of the incident. They were going after something, or perhaps someone. If I squint enough, I can see the eyes. Dr. Bryant is concerned I'm having migraines, but I brush him off by pretending to swallow some pain meds. Thankfully, he seems to buy that my other journal is legit, that I've accepted that I'm just stressed, and that I just need to care for my patients. More symptoms are showing up. Thank God, not for Elijah or Kyra, but other patients are changing. Robert and Agnes are both yellow, despite their liver function seeming normal. I did hear a strange story about several pounds of carrots vanishing from the kitchen, but I always thought that was an urban legend. The little girl I said wanted to be president? Her name is Jennifer. She keeps losing teeth. Like, not the way little kids do. I mean, she spits out teeth, and there are no gaps in her gums. She has too many teeth, and they're getting sharper with each shedding. I don't notice anything wrong with me, but there are whispers about some of the other staff showing strange symptoms. Cravings, insomnia, mood swings, all of which are being brushed off as stress from the long hours. There's also the whole aversion to the sacred thing, which is why I think I haven't been able to pray. Again, ignored. We're part of the experiment now, because that's what this is, an experiment. Karen got out. Holy fuck. She's not human. I didn't even realize it was her at first. I looked down to hand Kyra the right pills. I heard a scream, and when I looked up, I saw this creature. Eight feet tall, skin stretched so tightly over its body, it cracked and tore in several places. But instead of blood, it oozed black. Its eyes were so wide it looked scared, and it was crouched as it watched the room without blinking. Its jaws stretched open, unfolded, and peeled back until it covered its face, the flesh unfolding like flower petals and revealing rows of spines and teeth. Then it roared and charged. I nearly wet myself. I couldn't even shout for help. It charged through tables, throwing them out of its way like they were nothing. A nurse that got in its way was given the same treatment, and he hit the wall with a crack as loud as a gunshot. It skidded to a stop just a few feet in front of me. Its mouth folded back, closed, and I finally recognized those stretched eyes. And I recognized the face protruding from its chest, even if its expression was one of terror. Karen's clawed hand raised in the air. Barry's smaller hands reached up to hide his eyes. Elijah tackled the disturbing chimera before it could kill me. He slammed it into the ground, holding it down, until one of its claws shot up and sliced open his throat. I only unfroze when I saw Elijah's face go chalk white as blood poured from his neck. My whole vision went red, and I attacked Karen with my bare hands. I don't know how I did it. I'm not even a fighter or that strong. But when the fog of war cleared, the monstrous Karen was curled up on the ground, groaning, a bloodied mess. I was soaked in gore. Barry's head lay in my lap. His eyes flicked around as he seemed to struggle with what was going on. Kyra took Barry's head and hid it under a table before security arrived. Elijah claimed he was the one who beat Karen to a pulp to save me. His throat was fine, but he was still drenched in blood. Blood they assumed was Karen's, not his. I still don't remember, but they'll check the cameras soon. They'll see that I somehow took down Karen. If they do, I hope they tell me. The eyes are everywhere. I see them on the ceiling. And when I close my eyes, I see them staring back at me. I hear mother's voice. I think we all do. Karen was trying to go to her, but she was confused. Barry is being hidden and taken care of by Kyra. We all know now that this isn't a chemical spill, that this isn't anything remotely made by man. Her children are perverting, mutating in ways she did not guide by keeping mother here. We're not right. 
We won't be right until her chains are taken off. We'll go to Mother tonight. We'll set her free. Entry 16 Elijah started the riot just on time. He made a joke about doing this all the time while he was behind bars, but I think he was lying. The other patients joined in. Some of the nurses did too, the ones who are hiding their extra eyes. In the pandemonium, I headed for the morgue with Kyra. Thankfully, all the enigmatic security was upstairs handling the riot. We got in easily. Mother was chained to the wall, and she didn't look so good. To be fair, I don't know how she looks when she's not under heavy drug protocols, but she is not someone who wants to be on her knees. Her black form oozed, and that is not right. She is meant to stay whole. Kyra and Myra are her favorite children. It turns out when Mother was attacked, she lashed out, exposing us all to her gifts and power. Myra would have been turned into nothing, but instead, she joined Kyra. Like how Barry joined Karen, except, well, less cannibalism and a much neater meld. If I squint, I can see them overlapping each other. They're very similar, but Myra is taller, her hair is in twists, whereas Kyra's is cropped short. Mother can't get out on her own. But if Kyra takes her in like she did Myra, we can all get out of here alive. Enigmatic doesn't like letting go of its guinea pigs, but they won't have a choice if we are all one. I am writing this to say goodbye, just in case I can't be free after this. I'll be forever bonded to Kyra like Myra is. There's always a chance it'll go wrong. I love you, Dad. Take care of my siblings. But we need to leave now. We're not one of you anymore. We are something unknown, something more. We are the children of the Wild's mother. Entry 17. It's been a few months, and I'm mostly leveled out. I feel mostly like myself. Not drunk on Mother's Kool-Aid, so to speak. I can barely grasp what she's meant to be. It's beyond human understanding, and I'm still mostly human. Physically speaking, just my hands are different. After Kyra spat us all out back at the campground where all this happened, the transformation had officially taken hold and it only took a few days to finish. The flesh on my hands has peeled back, braiding around my wrists like macabre bracelets. To a casual observer, it looks like my hands are just bones. There's still something tying them together. I can move them as quickly as before, and the sensation is mostly normal. I still sometimes jump when I look down. Other than Elijah, I'm the most normal out of the escapees from the enigmatic ward. He still looks human, except his eyes being slightly too bright, his teeth being just a touch too sharp. And, well, the fact that he can quite literally take anything thrown at him and walk away with nothing. We run errands into town at times, drop off letters to family members, pick up some snacks that campers don't bring often enough, get new clothes for the ones we grow out of. Barry's the one who's grown the most. He's practically a human again, even if he is much shrimpier than he used to be. He and Karen renewed their vows before the cavern Mother hid in. She's recovered well, but she's still seething with rage about what Enigmatic did to her, and I think she's not quite done unleashing her revenge on them. We're not either. We're laying low and might do it for years. They've come looking for us, but they've never found us. And if they get too close, well, Karen handles it. And if Karen doesn't handle it, Kyra and Myra do. They've never been able to separate. Myra was quite literally disintegrated when Mother lashed out, but they've worked something out. Every other day, they switch who's in control, and their body changes to reflect which sister is at the front that day. I do still prefer Kyra. She's more easygoing, but Myra's a lot of fun to hang out with. She's just a touch more morbid with the enigmatic goons she catches. Good lord, I'd much prefer being ripped limb from limb by Karen. We didn't intend on becoming a family. Our plans in life didn't include being mutated and changed from humans to whatever we are now, but it's okay. We'll survive, live, and be happy. Then, when Enigmatic least expects it, we'll be back. And this time, it won't be just a few dead security guards that they'll be covering up.
Jeff, the Killer. Written by K. Banning Kellum. Narrated by Steve Gray. Don't do it, Chief. It's just too risky, Monica Davenport urged, following behind the slow, sweaty man waddling before her. Monica, if I've told you once, I've told you a million times. You don't let chances slip by in journalism. Benny Rosenberg, editor-in-chief of the NOLA Watch, replied, Sir, he's a disturbed child. He killed his parents. If you really believe he'll just sit down and talk to you, then you're as nuts as he is, Monica retorted. Benny stopped sharply, almost causing the small woman to crash into his flabby, moist back. He turned to the left, and with some obvious effort, moved around the desk of his cramped office and landed in his chair. Monica waited for the inevitable crash, as she was quite sure his chair couldn't take much more abuse. However, it held. One of the jokes around the office was that Rosenberg's chair was made in the future and shipped back in time just to support his ass. They joked, but never to his face. The NOLA watch was small, underfunded, and barely in business most months. It started as a small college paper at Tulane University and grew almost overnight in popularity. The Tulane students thought that perhaps they'd created the next Facebook, only in print form, and quickly went to work trying to legitimize their little college rag. A year later, it had actually grown, but sadly, it had grown too fast. They'd hired Rosenberg because he was a veteran in the New Orleans journalism world, but due to a heart attack, he had been forced to all but retire. Larger papers like the Times-Picayune or the New Orleans Advocate wouldn't hire him due to his poor health. However, when the two college whiz kids reached out to Benny about working part-time, he volunteered to do it under one condition. He'd be allowed to run it his way. They agreed, and now Benny was the head man behind a small paper that barely qualified as a tabloid, as, like so many internet successes, had begun to die out almost as soon as it went public. Monica was Benny's assistant editor. She was fresh from college and eager to learn and make her name in the world of the printed word. She grew up reading Rosenberg's editorials, so when she was given the chance to work for him, she'd jumped on it without hesitation. Now, though, now she'd begun to worry. Chief, I still think you're nuts, but if you insist on going through with this, at least let me come with you, she begged. Ah. So sweet that you care, Rosenberg replied. Monica did care. She liked the chief, even if he was a loud-mouthed glutton that smelled like moldy onions by midday. For all of his loud tantrums and arrogant views, she knew that he cared deeply about the news. He also hired her for a job that she was hardly qualified for and had no past experience in, so she owed him that too. However, she also wanted to be there. If it was true, if he was going to show up and talk to Rosenberg, break the silence, and actually give an interview. Monica wanted to be there. It was selfish, sure, but it was the career that she hoped to one day set trends in. Chief, what if he attacks you? I mean, you've seen the pictures of his family, and he's killed at least one other victim that we know of. Could be more. Just let me come with you, Monica demanded again. He's a kid, Monica, 15 years old, probably scared shitless every night. He wants to tell his story, and for God knows what reason, he chose the NOLA watch to be his sounding board. No way in hell I'm turning that chance down. I've covered stories in Kosovo, Kuwait, hell, even Iraq, back when that shit first kicked off. You really think I'm going to turn tail and hide at the sight of a teenager? He's not just any kid. He's crazy. Who knows what's going through his mind? To stab your own parents to death? I mean, who does that? Lyle and Eric Menendez, and believe me, every reporter in this country was climbing over each other to interview them, Rosenberg replied in a matter-of-fact tone. Yeah, interview them from behind bars. This is different. Jeffrey Woods has been on the run for two weeks now. The cops can't find him, and all of a sudden you get an invitation to meet him for a sit-down? Something about this feels very wrong, Chief. Very, very wrong, Monica answered. That's why you're going to call the cops if I don't text you every 20 minutes telling you that I'm all right, the chief replied. If I were there, she began again, but Rosenberg cut her off. Listen, 
You're going to be a great reporter someday, Monica. You'll be the next fucking Katie Couric. But you can't get there if you're dead. You think I'm stupid? I know this kid is nuts. I've read all about him. Jeffrey Woods, better known around the world as Jeff the Killer. I really wish I'd been the one to give him his nickname, as it's taken the damn world by storm. USA Today got the jump on giving him that title, though. So bully for them. But he specifically told me to come alone. It's all in the note we found. You know that as well as I do. Chances are, if he gets spooked, that's when he'll get dangerous. I'm going to go alone. Meet him, hear his story, and then we can put the NOLA watch on the map. I'll even let you take lead as editor on it. How's that? Monica looked down at the note on Rosenberg's desk. It had turned up a day ago, just slipped in the mail. No one currently outside of Rosenberg's office knew it even existed. This Jeffrey Woods had, for reasons unknown, reached out to Rosenberg to tell his story. Maybe it was because the NOLA watch was such a small paper. Maybe he'd read something in the watch that he really liked before he went nuts, and he had fond memories. Or maybe he just randomly selected the watch and went with it. He was crazy, so who could tell what his reasons for anything really were? The note read as follows. To Benny Rosenberg, editor of NOLA Watch. This is Jeffrey Woods, known on the cover of every single newspaper as Jeff the Killer. I will be at the old fireworks tent on Bayou Road in Mandeville for one hour on August 18th at 8 p.m. If you want to hear my side of the story, come alone. Only you, Mr. Rosenberg. Be on time, Jeff. Why do you think he chose us? Monica asked. I don't know, but he did. This is a once-in-a-lifetime story, and I have to go out there and get it. Okay, fine. I can see that you've made up your mind. Will you at least bring a gun or something? She asked. I'll have my little Smith & Wesson 38, although I doubt I'll need it. This kid is deranged. He wants to be heard, and that is exactly what I'm going to allow him to do. This will be a soft interview. Just a tape, a recorder, and a fat man with a bad heart. Super easy. He'll get his chance to have his little confessional, and I'll get the chance to make the NOLA watch a real newspaper. Everyone wins. What about the police? Shouldn't we just let them know so they can arrest him at the end of all this? Monica, what are they teaching you in those schools these days? I call the cops, and they'll just come out there and screw the whole operation. The press and the cops have never been a good mix. I don't expect them to do my job, so they can't very well expect me to do theirs, now can they? Fine, Chief. You win. I'll sit at home and wait for your texts, but if I don't hear from you on time, each time, I'm calling the cops. You can figure out whose job it is to do what then, but I won't just sit by if I don't hear from you, Monica stated, and crossed her arms sharply, indicating that there would be no debate on this. Fine with me, the fat man replied as he struggled to stand up from behind his desk. It's getting late anyway. It's a 30-minute drive from here to Mandeville. Then I've got to find the fucking place he's talking about, so I figure I'll head out now. Please be careful, Monica softly insisted, before grabbing the large man and hugging him hard. Darling, I've told you time and time again, if you're going to make it in this business, you have to harden up, Rosenberg said to her, but he said so while returning the hug. Benny Rosenberg left his office in downtown New Orleans, dodging the traffic as he moved his large Cadillac down Canal Street, making his way toward the I-10 on-ramp. He felt the safety of the city around him, people all about, representing a degree of security in the form of humanity and life. He merged onto the interstate and soon found himself on the Causeway Bridge, a 25-mile bridge that spanned over Lake Pontchartrain, connecting New Orleans to Mandeville. The ride to the North Shore normally felt long and tiring, too short for a pit stop but just long enough to drag on. Today, though, it seemed to zoom by. Rosenberg would never admit this to Monica, but on the inside he was very nervous. This could be a prank. This could be some copycat trying to make a name for himself, or this could turn out to be a massive waste of time. And if the real Jeff Woods did happen to be waiting for him, what then? I'll figure it out, as I always have, one piece at a time, he mumbled, as he arrived in the tree-lined bedroom community that was Mandeville. Rosenberg pulled over in a gas station and consulted his GPS. 
He found Bayou Road easily enough, as the harsh yet useful voice of Siri guided him through the heavily wooded areas. Suburban sprawl was the big thing on this side of the lake. However, there were still a lot of areas that were left untouched. What looked like woods on the outside usually turned out to be nothing more than a half acre of unsold lot. Still though, Rosenberg wished that he was conducting this interview from his downtown office. At least there were lights and people nearby. He was slowly becoming more and more aware that this location would likely be smack in the middle of nowhere. It took a little looking, but at around 7 p.m., he located Wild Bill's fireworks. It was a small tent that no doubt saw hundreds of visitors around the 4th of July and New Year's, but sat as a lonely and forgotten structure all the rest of the year. That was certainly the case tonight, as the tent sat slumped in the darkening August evening. It was situated in a small gravel lot. From what Rosenberg could tell, there were no homes or businesses for at least a quarter of a mile in either direction. He knew as well as anyone that he was overweight with a heart condition, so running away was not an option should this go south. However, he still had faith in his skill as a reporter, though it had been many years since he had actually done field work. He reminded himself again that if this does turn out to be the real deal, Jeffrey Woods was just a 15-year-old boy. The papers made him out to be some sort of demonic sociopath. They dubbed him Jeff the Killer, and they plastered the now famous photo of his deformed face, taken by the son of his last victim, all over the papers and internet. However, Rosenberg felt confident that despite all of that, he could control this situation. He sent a text to Monica, letting her know that he had arrived early and that he would communicate with her further starting at 8 p.m., when and if this interview even happened. He carefully entered the tent, his hand on his pistol, just to get an idea of where this would be taking place. It was small inside. There was a dry-rotted countertop where he assumed a cash register would sit during the open seasons. The rest of the tent was empty, save for a small folding chair. Rosenberg inspected the chair and found a small scrap of paper taped to the backrest. Sit down, the scrap read. Rosenberg searched a bit further and found beneath the chair was a small battery-powered lamp. It was one of those that people take camping, small and compact, yet he knew that once it got fully dark outside, it would light this tent up perfectly. He tested the lamp and found that it worked fine. Both the chair and the lamp seemed new, free of the dust of this place. This at least served to validate this entire outing. He could take at least a degree of comfort in knowing that it wasn't just a stupid prank. He sat down and removed his pack of cigarettes, something both his wife and doctor badgered him about without remorse. He lit a smoke and waited. Full dark came faster than he'd expected, and soon he realized that the tent was almost fully dark. Reaching down, he clicked the button that activated the lamp, and upon looking up, realized he was no longer alone in the tent. At first, they just sat in silence, the overweight man wearing a brown suit and the new arrival, a young man, sitting on the counter. The shadows played their games well in the small, humid tent. Rosenberg could tell the intruder was young and male just by the profile of his face. He had black hair that hung down over his forehead, almost to his eyes, he was wearing a black jacket and blue jeans. His head was tilted into the shadows, so that only half of his face showed in the light cast by the lamp. From Rosenberg's current angle, the kid almost looked normal. Rosenberg focused on remaining professional. He had to admit that he was never really sure this would actually happen. He still wasn't totally sure this kid was the real Jeffrey Woods, but he figured a few questions would solve that. He was still trying to decide how to open the conversation when he remembered his deal with Monica. That would do just fine to break the ice as well. Hey, I have to take out my cell phone and text my assistant, okay? If she doesn't hear from me every so often, she's going to freak out and call the cops. The shadowy figure did not respond, but did tilt his head slightly as if trying to get a better look at what Rosenberg was doing. Rosenberg removed his phone slowly making sure to make no sudden movements, and activated his screen. 
He already programmed a message to send with just a tap of a button to Monica, simply stating, All is well. After sending the message, he left the phone on his knee, as so to avoid that uncomfortable tango in the future. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take out my audio recorder. It's in my suit coat pocket. Rosenberg informed the silent figure, who once more appeared to move his head slightly, but made no attempt to speak. Rosenberg removed the recorder and held it in his hand. Before we begin, I just have to ask. You are Jeffrey Woods, correct? He asked. I was, the youth replied, speaking for the first time. Fair enough. I just asked in case this was some sort of prank, Rosenberg confirmed and clicked the record button on his audio device. Okay, I'm recording our conversation from this point forward. The youth spoke again. Does this look like a prank to you? He asked and tilted his head in the other direction. Rosenberg immediately recognized the disfigurement that dominated the left side of Jeffrey Wood's face. It was, after all, plastered on just about every news outlet and paper in the country. Okay, Rosenberg began, choosing his words carefully. You already know who I am since you did contact my office directly, and the whole nation and half the world has heard of you, so let's start with... Jeff cut him off, raising his voice slightly. Do you know why I chose you, Mr. Rosenberg? Honestly, no, the editor replied. Since the incident two weeks ago, since... since I killed my parents, the whole world has labeled me a monster. They call me Jeff the Killer. This picture, the one taken when I broke into that man's house a week ago, it's become my identity, at least as far as the world is concerned. But your paper, I saw the article that you wrote. You headlined it, Jeffrey Woods, America's Sensation. In the piece, you never once refer to me as Jeff the Killer. You actually tried to tell the story. I read that, and I don't know. I figured since you were the only one out there that seemed to want to tell a real story, I would at least fill in the details. Rosenberg was actually a bit relieved. Jeff seemed to be talking sane. He was coherent and seemed calm. This was a good sign. It was also a plus that his previous article had struck a bond with Jeff, as that would help grease the wheels of conversation here. Okay, Jeffrey. Or do you prefer Jeff? Rosenberg asked. Jeff is fine, he replied. Okay, Jeff, before we get started, I have to ask you, what is your end game here? I mean, you're wanted by the police, the FBI. Hell, just about everyone wearing a badge has a stake in capturing you, so tell me, how long can you keep this up? Aren't you concerned about your face, the possibility of infection? And what are you doing for food and lodging? I don't really know. Honestly, I didn't think it had ever come to this. But forget all that. What I do after this interview, I guess I'll figure it out. What I want to tell you about is how this all happened. How I, you know, Jeff stated flatly, rubbing the wounded side of his face, likely without being aware he was doing so. Okay, well, just start at the beginning. What was life like for you before, before the murders? Jeff took a deep breath and began his story. You ever hear about those perfect little families? Like on TV? Mom, Dad, two kids and a dog? Well, that was my parents' dream. I don't know how or why it ever came to that, but that is what they wanted, and they just had to have it. My parents, Shelia and Matt Woods, they were like, perfect for each other. They both had this image of, well, the way things should be, I guess. They came from poor families, did you know that? Their parents worked like crazy to put them through college. I know, because my parents liked to tell me that about three times a day. I guess that put some sort of obsession into them. They had to have things a certain way. We all grew up in New Orleans East, myself and my brother Lou. We lived in a small, two-bedroom apartment, and my parents hated it. Me and Lou loved it, though. We knew all the kids in the neighborhood because, well, we grew up with them all. Our apartment, it was called Walnut Square, and it was like its own little city. We had our group, and sometimes our group would get into a war with another group, but not like a gang war or anything, just like kids playing army, I guess. 
we'd always be friends at the end of the day. Me and Lou were only a year apart in age, so we were close. More like friends than brothers. We didn't fight much, and when no one else was able to come out and play, we always had each other. Things were okay back in Walnut Square, even with the way our parents were. Rosenberg asked, What do you mean by the way our parents were? Jeff continued, Fake? I think fake is the best way to describe them. Like, when other kids were around, they acted totally different. They were the fun parents, always joking and being involved. I remember when we'd have friends from school spend the night, my parents would take us all over the ZM video, the local neighborhood video store. We'd pick out a couple of horror movies and a video game or something, and then we'd all head back to our apartment. My parents would make popcorn and try and scare us during the movie. They'd sit out there and tell us all stories about when they were kids. Stuff that they never did when it was just me and Lou. At the end of the weekend, when all the other kids would go back home, my mother would actually tell them to let their parents know how much fun they had over at our house. Once they would leave, though, my folks would go right back to their normal selves. They would either retreat into their bedroom and shut the door, or they would go off to do their own things, leaving me and Lou alone. I remember Lou asking my mother once if we could have a movie night. You know what she told him? Rosenberg shook his head. She told him to call up all his friends and see if they can come over. While Lou was making phone calls, my mother actually started getting out popcorn and stuff. But as soon as Lou came out and told her that they couldn't make it, she put it all away and told him that she wasn't feeling up to a movie. I mean, can you believe how shitty that must have felt to him? His own mother was happy to put on this great show in front of other people's kids, but couldn't be bothered to spare two hours to watch a movie with her own son. That sounds rough, Rosenberg replied. Yeah, well, it was always like that, and I was pretty used to it by then. My father put me in boxing lessons because his boss's brother worked at the gym. I went there for about a year, got pretty good at it, until the boss's brother quit. No sooner was I pulled out of the classes. My father told me that it was because we couldn't afford the lessons, but I knew that was bullshit. Just the week before, he had talked about signing me up for another year. Then as soon as the brother quits, we suddenly can't afford it anymore. Like I said, Lou still believed a lot of their crap, but I was seeing through it mostly. And yeah, it sucked. Well, do you think your parents' distance brought you and your brother close together? Rosenberg asked. I think we would have been close no matter what. But yeah, having parents like ours, you had to come together. My parents always sort of ignored Lou the most. That's not to say that I was their favorite or anything, because I don't think my parents favored either of us all that much. But Lou, he wasn't a part of the plan, I guess. Rosenberg inquired, was he an unplanned pregnancy? You mean, like an accident baby? No, they wanted that baby. They just didn't want another boy. I found this out years after he was born. I overheard them talking one night. Turns out they wanted a boy and a girl to really round it all out. They had this whole thing planned out. My mother did all the herbal crap to try to make sure Lou was a girl. Followed all these baby books. The reason his name is so weird is because they originally planned out the girl name as Luna, or some weird shit like that. It was sort of like the Spanish word the moon. So when my mom found out she was having another boy, I think she just said fuck it and kept the name about the same. She wanted that name, and I guess she was determined to get it, so hence we had Lou. You know, it was just pronounced like Lou, but my parents had to stick as close to their plan as possible. I think they had serious issues that we never really saw. So your folks wanted a girl, had the name picked out and all, and when your brother was born, they stuck with the same name for the most part, Rosenberg asked. Yep, that was them for you. No changing in the plans. Jeff and Luna just became Jeff and Lou. That was how they thought, Jeff replied. Rosenberg, sensing that it was time to move this interview forward, took a risk and went with a direct question. So Jeff, did your parents ever hit you? Was the abuse ever physical? Jeff laughed, a laugh that started out as an almost honest, youthful sound. However, it quickly began to rise into a shrill burst of almost hysterical giggling. <laughs> I wish!
fish? Oh, man, I wish that were the case. No, they, they never hit us. Hitting us would have required actually paying attention to us. No, they just ignored us away until it was time to try and impress a friend or neighbor. Then they dragged us out to show us off. Okay, so I get that your folks ignored you, neglected you and your brother. What I don't get is how you wound up here, sitting across from me in this tent. I mean, sure, it sounds like your folks weren't trying to win any parenting awards, but you seem like a smart enough kid. You grew up well, had food and clothing, education and everything else. What made you... Rosenberg was trying to find the right word when Jeff assisted him. Snap, Jeff asked, that shrill edge still hanging slightly in his voice. Yes, what caused this? Rosenberg pressed. You got your recorder on, right? Jeff asked. Of course, the reporter replied. Okay, sit back and listen. Light up a smoke and get comfortable, Jeff responded, and in the dark and shadowy confines of the small tent, Jeff Woods, known better as Jeff the Killer, told his story. By the time he was finished, the recorder was down to half-battery life, and Rosenberg had smoked half his pack of cigarettes. The Birth of the Killer Jeff was fifteen years old. Lou was fourteen, on the day that their parents came home, all smiles, calling for their two kids to come to the living room. This was a rare occurrence in the Woods home, as their parents typically returned from work and went into their own private worlds. Matt Woods would generally find his way to the living room and start binge-watching network news, while Shelia Woods made her way into their bedroom and started catching up on her Bravo network television. The two brothers typically didn't see their folks until around 7 p.m. when a rushed family meal would be prepared, eaten in relative silence, and once consumed, all members would return to their respective wings of the small apartment. Tonight, though, tonight appeared to be different. Boys, come to the living room, boys, Shelia announced with an eager, joyous edge to her voice that was mostly absent these days. Jeff and Lou came out of their shared bedroom, where they had been busy plugging away at a game of Madden that had locked them in constant competition for the better part of the year. What's up, Mom? Jeff asked first. Well, well, your father, he found out, Shelia stammered. Luckily, Matt was there to rescue the conversation. Boys, I got a promotion. I'm being placed in charge of the North Shore District. I'll be working specifically out of that office from now on. They're giving me a territory that is twice the size of my current assignment, and with that will come a lot more work. Lou, always starving for his father's attention, quickly congratulated his dad. Good job, Dad! Really awesome! Lou shouted with genuine excitement. That's not all, Shelia interjected. With this new job comes even more exciting news. We're finally going to get to move to a bigger place. Shelia's grin was plastered from ear to ear. Jeff saw her huge, fake smile and thought that such grins could never come from a real place of human emotion. So, we're moving? Jeff asked, an obvious hint of teenage angst laced in his voice. Yes, his father replied. We'll be moving to Mandeville. It's a nice, safe town with a great school system and lots of woods and nature for you boys to explore. You two won't have to take the public bus to school anymore. You won't have to worry about any bad parts of town. It's going to be a real good change for this family. But what about our friends here? Our school? I, I don't think I want to move to a new school. I hate having to make new friends, and all the kids there will already know each other and... Jeff began to rattle on, but his mother quickly roped it in. Jeff, you'll make new friends. Plus, Mandeville is only 25 miles away from where we are right now. It's not like we're moving out of state. This is a good chance to really move up. Don't ruin it with your attitude, okay? Jeff looked over and saw the discomfort on Lou's face. Sure, he didn't want to move, but Lou seemed more open to the idea. Plus, it was nice to see their parents actually happy for a change. Jeff swallowed the agitation that was building up in him and put on a smile that he hoped looked more organic than the one his mother had been wearing. Okay, Mom. Sorry. Yeah. Of course I am happy for Dad. I'm good with this, Jeff stated, knowing that his lie was probably obvious. 
but was happy that Lou at least seemed to take visible comfort in having the family all back on the same page. Six weeks passed between that conversation and the day the Woods family actually pulled into their new home, keys in hand, with a delivery truck following close behind. During those six weeks, Jeff and his family packed their possessions, house-hunted, packed some more, and eventually the two boys began to feel the blues of saying goodbye to the neighborhood they'd known since birth. Jeff and his neighborhood pals rode their bikes and played as always, but deep inside a sadness had built up in him. He knew that he was saying goodbye to the friends and locations that he loved. He hoped to get his driver's license soon, and then he could come back over and visit. But that still seemed distant, and from where he was currently standing, he felt as though he was on the cusp of saying farewell to his entire life. He kept trying to pep talk himself, telling himself that on the upside, at least it was the summertime. He wouldn't have to walk into a new school mid-year, being stared at by the kids like some breed of rare bird or something. He could take the rest of the summer and try to get to know the kids of Mandeville, and hopefully, by the time late August hit and he had to walk into Mandeville High School, a sophomore, he'd at least have a couple friends. He also had Lou, who would be starting as a freshman that year, so he wouldn't be totally alone. The day he and his family arrived at their new home, the sky was overcast and the weather was muggy. The gray skies seemed to punctuate his mood. Jeff was not thrilled to be here. Their new home was beautiful, though. A true example of his father's newfound success, but still, it wasn't the home he'd known. He and Lou would have their own bedrooms for the first time ever, though, and he had to admit he was a little excited about the new privacy. So, he and Lou spent that week setting up their new place. Jeff's room was on the second floor of the house, and the window featured a great view of the wooded areas behind their new house. At night, a billion stars would come out, a sight that Jeff never had been able to enjoy in the city. Their new house also had a yard, both front and back, and his father had already invested in a lawnmower and informed the boys that it would be their task to maintain the landscaping. This, of course, meant allowance and more spending money, so Jeff had no issues with that. A week after they'd settled in, Jeff and Lou woke up early. The sky was a crisp and gorgeous blue, and although the Louisiana heat was playing its usual cruel tricks, the brothers decided that a morning bike ride to explore the area would be just the right ticket to combat the slight pangs of homesickness that they'd both been experiencing over the last week. Matt and Shelia were both at work, so Jeff and Lou made themselves a quick bite to eat downstairs before heading out. I miss home, Lou blurted out as Jeff was smearing salsa on the microwaved burrito that would serve as his breakfast. Me too, Lou. But I guess this is home now, so we just sort of have to make the most of it, Jeff replied. I know, but all of our friends and stuff are back in Walnut Square. Remember that building we'd always sneak up on top of and watch the city lights come on? I miss that, Lou responded, sounding down. Yeah. In ZM Video, the owner knew us, would always let us rent R-rated movies without our parents, and he'd always hook us up with a free video game rental if we got a few movies. Yeah, I miss that too. But Lou, we have to... Lou interrupted. I know. We have to make the most out of this, but still, this place just seems so fake, and Mom and Dad still treat us like we aren't even here. Jeff sighed. Yep. They do. I was sort of hoping the new house would improve their mood, but what can we do? Lou had no answer. Jeff finished his breakfast and the two boys left the house to mount their bikes and explore around a bit more. As it turned out, the subdivision they moved into was rather close to a cluster of stores in a small shopping center. After riding a bit, going up and down generic streets that featured the same vinyl-sided homes with their kept-up lawns, the boys came across the place. Village Shopping Center was the name of the short row of businesses. Within these were a pizza hut, a Chinese restaurant, a tobacco store, a Sprint store, and what Jeff and Lou were most excited about, a video store. Friendly Video was the name of the place, and it certainly looked friendly enough. From outside, the boys could see rows upon rows of new movies and a respectable collection of classics. Jeff felt a rise in his mood. Sure, this wasn't ZM video, 
This wasn't the store he had grown up with, but still, having one this close meant that he and Lou could continue at least one tradition from their old lives. Jeff and Lou parked their bikes against the wall of the store, propping them near the glass walls so they could keep an eye on them, a habit any kid growing up in the city develops quickly, and entered the store to browse the selection. We'll have to get Mom or Dad to come down here and open up an account so we can rent movies, Lou mentioned as Jeff flipped a box over to read the description of a horror movie. Shit, you're right, Jeff snapped, feeling a bit of frustration at this thought. He knew getting his parents to actually come down here and set up a membership would take forever, since their usual after-work routine was to go off into separate rooms until they got hungry enough to come out and speak. Jeff glanced over at the girl working behind the counter. Maybe I can go over there and sweet-talk her into giving us accounts, Jeff joked. Yeah, right, Jeff. One look at you and she'll probably ban us, Lou remarked back, a smile broad on his face. You doubt me, little man. Jeff replied, both siblings now giggling. Doubt you? The guy who's kissed two girls and almost touched a boob? Never. Please, go on over and lay on all the charm. Whatever. I totally could have banged that girl, but her parents came home and... Jeff retorted. Last time you told me that story, you said her parents were out of town and her sister came home. Jeff became flustered, and while in the process of trying to make yet another comeback... The girl behind the register removed all doubt by speaking to the boys herself. Hey, aren't those your bikes? The young woman asked, pointing towards the glass window. Jeff and Lou looked over and saw three boys outside, two of which were riding around in circles on the Woods Brothers' bikes. They would spin them around and then jump off, letting the bikes crash onto the pavement, just to stand them up and ride them again. The two boys riding the bikes were both slim in build, while a heavier boy stood on the sidewalk, drinking a Red Bull and watching. Jeff and Lou made their way toward the doors of the video store when the fat kid saw them coming. Jeff couldn't hear what he said to his two friends, but he made some sort of gesture while shouting. And the other two boys dumped the bikes where they lay and walked towards the sidewalk, directly towards the two brothers. Those your bikes? One of the boys asked as Jeff and Lou entered the summer heat. Yeah. Why are you riding them? Lou asked sharply. We just saw them out there, man. Relax. Figured someone just left them out for us. The same boy responded as his two friends joined him on either side. Jeff and Lou were veterans of growing up in a crowded city apartment, and both boys knew what was likely coming. They dealt with assholes like this before, and the same script was almost always followed. First, they would provoke their victims in some way. Then would come a sarcastic exchange of words, and usually, depending on how determined said assholes were to make trouble, some degree of physical contact always came next. Jeff determined to make a good start here, tried to change the course of this confrontation. Well, they're ours. We just moved here about a week ago. We live over on Fairmont Avenue, a few blocks from here. We were just checking out the neighborhood. Jeff hoped that a civil tone could turn things around, but he could tell by the insolent look on the kid's face that this was a difficult gamble. Good for you! You moved somewhere! The fat kid remarked. The other boy, the one who'd yet to speak, remained silent, though he did spit on the ground, aiming close to Jeff's shoe, a move so obvious he may as well have just tried to spit in Jeff's face. Oh yeah, Troy, the first boy spoke. I moved into that piece of shit house with a gravel driveway. I was wondering who would move into that place. Well, Randy, now we know. The big kid, apparently named Troy, replied. Jeff, still trying to salvage the conversation, tried peaceful banter one more time. Okay, so you're Troy, and you're Randy. Well, I'm Jeff, and this is my brother Lou. We just moved here from New Orleans. You ain't in New Orleans now, the third boy, who had just now decided to speak, remarked. Eh, yeah. who the fuck said you could call us by our names, Randy asked, that insolent, privileged smile never leaving his face. Jeff, finally realizing that this was going nowhere good, decided that diplomacy was clearly not the answer. Had he been older and wiser, perhaps he'd have simply mounted his bike, along with Lou, and headed home. Perhaps he would have gone back into the video store and waited the three boys out. But he was 15, 
and while he was mature for his age, he still fell victim to the impulsive and often destructive tendencies of his demographic. Jeff smiled and responded to Randy, Well, I guess I could have called you a fucking asshole, but I figured I would give you the benefit of the doubt. In that moment, a flare of rage replaced the smirk that had rested on Randy's face throughout this entire exchange. The other two boys, Troy and the still unknown third member of his band, seemed to be momentarily struck silent. Perhaps they weren't used to being stood up to. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that language too adult for you? Jeff asked. And you, quiet boy, we know this isn't New Orleans. Jeff stated to the slim kid that had reminded him of his geographical locations. Because if this was New Orleans, you three would have already gotten your asses kicked for touching someone else's shit. The slim kid looked back and forth at his two friends. However, Randy, clearly the leader, seemed to know what to say. Keith, you gonna let this little bitch talk to you like that? Jeff and Lou looked at each other, both knowing what would come next. A fight. Neither of the Woods children had been big into fighting, but they'd had their share of pricks like these in their lives. Now that Randy had clearly challenged Keith's place on the food chain, the skinny kid would no doubt be ready to go to blows. Jeff looked around, gathering his surroundings when he noticed the woman in the video store was staring out at them, a cordless phone in her hand. Jeff knew this part too. And while he wanted quite badly to sock Randy and his pals around, a second concern suddenly invaded his mind. If he and Lou got into a fight on their first week in this new neighborhood, their parents would freak. He could practically hear it now. And while things had been far from perfect in their home, even after the move, there was a peace that had fallen over the family. And Jeff, fighting his urges, decided to do his best to keep up. Jeff looked over the three. Very well-dressed, very privileged-looking suburban kids before them, and dismissed them. You guys are boring. Come on, Lou. Let them continue their play dates without us. Lou laughed at that and followed behind his brother towards the bikes. However, Randy and his little gang of would-be toughs would have none of that. They moved to block Jeff and his brother once again. Are you going, pussy? Randy asked, shoving Jeff. Jeff could tell that the shove had no real conviction. Randy was trying to figure him out, seeing where his buttons were. He'd push harder eventually. But Jeff swallowed the slowly building anger within him once more. Lou took a bit more exception to the shove. We're going to your mom's house. Me and my brother saved up a couple dollars from doing chores, and we hear she doesn't charge much. That seemed to do it. One sentence. One joke at the expense of Randy's mother was all it took. Perhaps had Lou kept quiet. Perhaps if Jeff had simply walked away. Perhaps if Randy and his friends weren't so intent on having this pissing contest with two kids they'd never met before. Perhaps things would have ended differently. However, the comment was made. The tempers flared and in the end, the wheel that his fate turned just enough to change the lives of all involved. As the words left Lou's mouth, Randy appeared to only register a small portion of it all. Randy Hayden had grown up in Mandeville. His father was a partner at a local firm that made a lot of money, something else that Jeff would soon come to learn. Randy and his friends, while the same age as Jeff, had grown up in very different circumstances. They were used to being listened to, they were used to being feared. They had been fostered into a world where money meant power, and their families had plenty of it. They weren't used to being told no, not even by their parents. And to have these two new kids, two kids from a poor part of New Orleans, show up on their turf, talk down to them, ignore their perceived dominance, well, that put them in a state of confusion and rage they'd never been prepared for. In fact, Randy, the target of the insult, just stood there. It was in fact Troy, the fat kid, who stepped forward, fist balled, eyes squinted in anger. Who are you talking to? Troy shouted and took a wild swing at Lou. Lou, who was both in better shape and had sparred with Jeff a time or two during his time spent boxing, was able to avoid the punch, but just barely. Had that been all, it may have once again ended there. Troy was clearly taken by surprise at Lou's speed and actually didn't attempt another punch. However, 
These were bullies, kids that ran in a pack for a reason. The skinny one, Keith, stepped around and threw a punch that connected with the left side of Lou's face. Jeff had seen enough. He had been shocked at how quickly this evolved into blows, even though he'd expected it from almost the start. When he'd first met Randy and his friends, he'd been curious. From there, he'd developed an annoyance with them, and slowly the annoyance had evolved into anger. However, upon seeing Lou punched, seeing the small trickle of blood form on his brother's lower lip, upon seeing the smug look of satisfaction on Keith's face, that anger that Jeff felt suddenly exploded into rage that he'd never felt before in his life. Jeff Woods did not hesitate. He stepped forward, his feet automatically falling into the correct stance that he'd learned from boxing, and delivered a powerful right hand to Keith's face. The skinny boy had no time to register shock or pain. The punch caught him by surprise, and his knees buckled. Keith went down to the ground in a heap of confusion and dawning fear. Randy, the so-called leader here, was almost too shocked to move. He'd had quite a lot of experience starting fights but no real time logged in losing them. He'd never felt control of a situation slip. He was used to being in charge. So now, seeing one of his friends go down so quickly and easily left him in a state of shock that he had no idea how to address. Troy, on the other hand, seemed to have a plan. Throw another punch. He moved towards Jeff deceptively faster than his weight would seem to allow and threw two equally fast punches. Jeff, however, had no problem sidestepping both attempts. Troy, seeming lost for actions, actually dropped his arms as if to say, Gee, what do I do now? Jeff had the answer. He moved in, throwing three hooks to Troy's stomach. The hefty kid's eyes went as wide as pie pans. A fitting analogy, Jeff thought. He staggered back, clutching his throbbing stomach. Jeff wasted no time and stepped in once more, fetching a sharp punch to the big kid's jaw, causing Troy to promptly fall on his ass. Jeff was reminded of King Hippo from the punch-out game he used to play. He couldn't help but smile. Jeff now turned his focus on Randy. He advanced on the boy, feeling something new forming inside of him. He still felt anger and the rage, actually, at the antics of these three assholes. They had the nerve to mess with their bikes. The nerve to insult two kids they'd never met before, and of course, the ultimate offense, touching his brother. However, mixed in with this rage was also a sweet, enjoyable pleasure. Not only was he kicking their asses, but he was loving every second of it. It was as though the joy of showing them up was perfectly blending with the rage he felt towards them. Together, it formed into a sadistic, controlled sense of power. Had Jeff gotten his hands on Randy at that moment in time, he had no idea how far he'd take things. Randy was actually backing away, his hands held up, not to fight, but in a defensive, surrendering type gesture. This only brought more joy to Jeff, and he was savoring every second of it. That was, until Lou stepped in front of him. Jeff, stop! That's enough! Lou shouted. Why stop, Lou? They wanted this. Jeff replied in a flat voice that Lou had never heard come from his brother's mouth. She's calling the cops! Look! Lou shouted again, and this time, Jeff came back to reality long enough to listen. He glanced over at the video store clerk and saw her on the phone, talking frantically and pointing towards the parking lot. Suddenly, Jeff's strange, sadistic haze collapsed and he regained his former self. Fuck, let's go! He stated quickly, and he and Lou mounted their bikes and rode towards the parking lot exit. Yeah, you better fucking run, Randy called behind them. Jeff and Lou paid not mind and pedaled away. A few blocks down the street, they dismounted their bikes and began to walk them together. At first, neither brother spoke. Then Lou broke the silence. Jeff, thank you for standing up for me back there. Thank you. Yeah. Those guys were pieces of shit. They had it coming. Jeff replied, looking down at the street as they walked. What? What happened to you? I've never seen you like that before, Lou asked. Just defending myself, Lou. What was I supposed to do? Let them beat you up? I bet they go to our school. I bet we'll see them there. And they won't forget this, Lou added. Who cares? We didn't ask to move here. We didn't ask for any of this. 
Mom and Dad just wanted a bigger house in a nicer neighborhood, and we were along for the ride, whether we liked it or not. Think I give a shit what these rich asshole kids think of us? Jeff stated, and went back to looking at his feet. Think we'll get in trouble? Lou asked. For what? Defending ourselves? Jeff asked. Yeah, I guess you're right. They did start it, Lou answered, and to the brothers, the matter was closed. However, things were far from over. Jeff and Lou spent another few hours exploring the area. They went deep into the wooded areas around their neighborhood. They found an abandoned shack far out in the woods. Jeff opened the doors and looked inside. He called Lou in and showed him that the place actually had running water. The boys figured it was used as some sort of hunting shack back before the area began to develop. They could tell that from the looks of it, it hadn't served its original purpose in a long time. They rode out of the woods and back into the town proper. They spent some time at a small soda shop, one of those places that tried to be retro. It used spelling like old and shop to try to add that appeal. They ordered burgers and dropped a few quarters in an old Galaga arcade machine before heading back home. They found that the trouble they believed they'd escaped was in fact waiting for them at their front door. Jeff and Lou saw the police cars well before they arrived at their driveway. Two cop cars, both parked in front of their house. Both of them felt their stomachs drop, as they well knew why the police were there. Jeff and Lou entered the living room to see their parents sitting on the couch, the two cops standing up, leaning on the wall, writing in their notebooks. What did you two do? Shelia practically screeched as the two boys entered the house. Lou, younger and less centered than Jeff, began to fall on the defensive. Some kids tried to jump us down by that video store. They were messing with our bikes, and when we went outside, they got in our faces. That's not what we heard, Matt Woods interjected, his voice firm and ripe with anger and dissatisfaction. No, Dad, that's what happened, Jeff began to explain. We were down at Friendly Video looking around the store when these three kids started riding around on our bikes. All we did was walk outside, and the kids started talking trash to us, trying to provoke a fight. When we tried to leave, one of them punched Lou. Shelia Woods did her famous head shake, her lips pressed together into a slim white line. She was looking at her two sons as though they were juvenile delinquents instead of the two boys raised. Finally, one of the two cops spoke. His name tag read Williamson. Boys, we have some serious complaints about the two of you. From what eyewitnesses at the shopping center say, you two started the confrontation with Randy and his friends. Jeff took notice at how familiar the cop's tone was when he said Randy's name. This was a small town, after all, and there was a good chance that this cop coached Randy in Little League or drank beers with his dad. Hell, it was even possible that this cop could be an uncle to one of the bullies. No, sir, Jeff replied. We didn't start it. They did. We just wanted our bikes. We just wanted to leave. They blocked us. Williamson continued as though he'd heard nothing Jeff said. Several witnesses, including the video store clerk, said that you swung first. They say that the boys were riding your bikes, but let me ask you this. Did you chain your bikes to anything, or did you just leave them outside the store? What's that matter? Lou demanded. Well, son, if you just left your bikes lying around in the street, you can't exactly blame Randy and his friends for riding them now, can you? It'd be different if you had secured them somehow, but you just left them there. Jeff felt that rage begin to build inside him again. He was young, but he wasn't stupid. He knew what this was. The cops knew Randy, Troy, and Keith. They were local kids, probably played football or some shit. Jeff and Lou were outsiders, city kids that came down to this bedroom community and were clearly making trouble from the start. Jeff began to understand that no matter what he said, no matter what really happened, the cops had already made up their minds. Jeff's only hope was his parents, distant or not. Surely they would defend their own kids over some local townie assholes. Mom, Dad, you're not buying this crap, are you? You know me and Lou don't start fights. When have we ever? These three punks messed with us, and if you can't tell that these cops are taking their sides, then you need to open your eyes. Jeff knew he was skating on thin ice. But that rage, it demanded some sort of satisfaction. Jeffrey, do not speak about these officers in that tone of voice. 
and do not speak to us that way either. Now, it's pretty obvious that you two aren't happy here, that you miss your old home, but starting fights in the street isn't going to change anything. Jeff's mother snapped back. Jeff noticed that his father was remaining silent. However he felt about this, it clearly wasn't worth speaking up about. Officer Williamson decided to do the speaking for him. Listen, boys, you're lucky. None of the parents want to press charges. This will be reported as a simple scuffle between teenagers. But be advised, you're both on notice. This is a quiet town, not like New Orleans. We don't tolerate this sort of behavior over here. If you see Randy, Keith, or Troy, I highly suggest you tell them you're sorry. We'll be keeping an eye on both of you. So don't let this happen again. You don't want to have an arrest record, do you? Jeff felt his anger bubble over, and he could not hold his tongue. Who is he to you, Officer Williamson? Is Randy your nephew? Is he a friend's son? Or maybe you go over and screw his mom while you're on duty. Which one is it, Officer? Jeff spoke his accusation in a controlled tone, but he felt that even that could burst at any moment. He worked hard to contain it. He saw that Williamson was blushing deeply, though. Perhaps he had struck a nerve after all. That's it. Both of you go to your rooms. Matt Woods apparently found that he wasn't a mute after all as he ordered his sons out of the room. Jeff and Lou walked up the stairs. However, they refused to hang their head in shame or feel any regret. Once in their rooms, they could hear the muffled conversation between their parents and the officers. Apologies could be heard. The cops said something back, and soon enough, they heard the front door to their house shut. Jeff and Lou looked at each other, knowing that the real conversation hadn't even started yet. However, neither of the parents spoke to them for the rest of that day. Jeff and Lou stayed upstairs, venting their shared frustration to each other. They'd been screwed over. Even at their young ages, they knew that. They took some solace in the fact that they at least hadn't been arrested or cited. But still, they saw what was really going on here. That cop. He was protecting Randy, Jeff whispered to his younger brother. No shit, his brother replied. We have to watch ourselves. We have to take care of each other. You saw it down there. Even our parents didn't stand up for us, Jeff stated. Yeah, what the hell was up with that? Lou asked. Image. Their fucking image. That's what's up with it. All they care about is fitting in here. They want to make sure they blend in with the rest of the Stepford families. No more fighting. If we see Randy or his two fuckhead friends again, we just walk away, okay? But Jeff, you can kick the shit out of them. Why would we walk away? Lou asked. Because I can't kick the shit out of the cops, Lou. I can't kick the shit out of Mom and Dad, and that's what would get us. Fucking Randy and his pals are protected here. You and me? We're not. So, if we see them, just avoid them, okay? Please? Lou nodded. I feel like a little bitch, though. I owe Keith for hitting me. No, you don't. I paid him back for that, and paid his fat friend, too. I hope they just leave us alone now, Jeff sighed. He was wrong about that, though. Even now, Randy was sitting in his parents' expensive house, with Keith and Troy gathered around like obedient puppies, plotting revenge. Jeff and Lou didn't hear from their parents for the rest of that day. They remained in their rooms late into the night and finally came down to eat after they were sure their folks had gone to bed. Lou said he felt relieved about that, but Jeff had a sinking feeling that the worst was yet to come. Jeff was correct, as the next morning when the two brothers came downstairs together to eat breakfast, their parents were already sitting at the dining room table, staring at the boys, approving of nothing they saw. Sit down, Matt said flatly. What's going on? Lou asked. Sit down, Matt stated again, anger dancing on the words. The boys complied without further question. Matt Woods began his diatribe. Whatever that was yesterday, beating up some kids for touching your bikes, mouthing off at the police, disrespecting both me and your mother, that stops today. We didn't beat anyone up for touching our bikes, Jeff blurted. Shut up, Jeff. This is a one-way conversation, his father barked. That kid, Randy Hayden, his father is a partner at my firm. Did you know that? Did you even think about that when you were assaulting him over your godforsaken bike? 
You just didn't think, did you, Jeff? Shelia added. How could I have known that? Jeff asked. Matt continued. Well, I've spent the entire morning talking to his father on the phone. His dad is willing to let it all go. But shit, son, I have to deal with that at work now. Do you have any idea how much damage this could have done to me? To our family? Jeff felt that rage coming back and fought with all his might to keep it stifled. He knew nothing good could come of it. Instead, he once more tried to appeal to the two adults' parental side. Mom, look at Lou's face. They split his lip. Can't you see? It's still swollen. Lou turned his head to better showcase the injury. My God, Jeff, so some kid played a little rough with your brother. Is that any reason to fight them? I wanted to make friends with some of the other families in this neighborhood, but thanks to you, I just don't know. Jeff and Lou were both struck with an almost stupefying awe when their mother began to shed tears. They shared a disbelief that this could really be happening. Sure. Shelia and Matt Woods were never going to win any parenting awards, but this level of intentional stupidity, it was simply staggering. No sooner could Jeff or his brother construct a proper defense than their father began speaking again. So, your mother and I have talked this through. Since there are only a couple weeks of summer vacation left, we've decided that Lou should spend the rest of the season at Aunt Marcy's place. We've already spoken to her and she's willing to let him come out there and stay. Both Jeff and Lou were floored by this decision. Both boys began to protest at the same time, but they saw the look on their parents' face. The decision was made. The discussion went on for about an hour just the same. The brothers attempted again and again to convince their parents otherwise. Jeff didn't want to see his only friend in this new town shipped off for the rest of the summer, and Lou, well, Lou knew that his aunt's house was no place for anyone under the age of 60. Her house was quiet well-kept, with no cable television and no form of entertainment. Aunt Marcy was strict on electronics, and both boys knew that no sort of video games would be allowed in her home. She ran a tight ship over there, dinner at 4 p.m., lights out at 9 p.m. Her house was always hot, as she never ran her air conditioning, even in the middle of the summer. The last time Jeff and Lou stayed there, they ended up sleeping on top of the blankets in nothing but their boxers, and still woke up covered in sweat. Yes, the Woods' parents knew exactly what they were doing. This wasn't about separating the brothers to avoid further problems. This was about cruel punishment. Why can't we both just go then? Jeff asked, a last-ditch effort to at least get away from his parents. Marcy doesn't want the both of you there. She says, you two are too rambunctious, and frankly, we agree, Shelia answered. Jeff began to speak, but his father stood up, stopping all conversation. Lou, go upstairs and pack for two weeks. We'll pick you up a couple days before school starts. You're only allowed to bring clothes and a couple of books. That's Aunt Marcy's conditions. You've got 20 minutes to pack. I'll drop you off there and then head into the office to try to do some damage control with Mr. Hayden. And so it was. Lou was shuttled off to his aunt's place in Abita Springs, Louisiana, a place even smaller and duller than Mandeville, if one can believe that. Jeff watched his brother leave and then walked back into his bedroom. He felt that rage. However, it began to feel almost pleasant to him. He couldn't explain it. He was furious at these turn of events. His parents had turned their backs on their own children. However, through it all, these new feelings he was experiencing weren't all terrible. This anger, for example. He could almost taste it. It felt like thick, sweet syrup stirring around in him. Of course, he knew the extra ingredient that would complete the flavor, that satisfying joy he had felt when he had Randy and his friends on the ropes that day prior, that mixed perfectly with the anger to create some intoxicating product that Jeff almost craved now. He fell asleep lying on his bed, thinking about that syrup, that thick, viscous, that seemed to work its way into the very fabric of his soul. He wanted it, yet he knew that it was destructive, and that nothing good could come from sampling it again. Several days passed, and tensions were high between Jeff and his parents. Without Lou around, there was nothing for him to do except sit in his room and play video games. He went outside, but didn't venture far from home. He knew if Randy and his goons showed up again, it would likely result in another fight. 
He knew a sore loser when he saw one, and Randy was certainly that. Instead, Jeff decided to keep his head down, stay out of his parents' path, and hope they'd allow Lou to come home sooner. For a few days, that worked well, and Jeff believed he could get through this. However, his mother changed all of that on an early Saturday morning. Jeff was awoken suddenly by sharp sunlight striking his face. He heard his mother humming, something she rarely did. Even in his half-sleeping state, he knew that humming was forced. She was doing it to wake him up, and figured the added sunlight would get things there even faster. When she noticed Jeff's eyes cracking open, she sauntered over to his bed and began speaking in a tone that simply oozed false joviality. Ten minutes later, Jeff was sitting at the kitchen table brooding. His mother had arranged for Jeff to go over and hang out with Randy at his house. Apparently, she'd reached out and talked to Randy's mother for a while, and both women decided that the boys simply needed to get to know each other better. Jeff, of course, saw through all of this. Randy's parents were wealthy and had clout in this area. Shelia had jumped on a chance to repair the damage done by the fight and also get to know Randy's parents a bit better. Of course, Jeff's father had been thrilled about the idea. Randy's dad was a partner at his firm, and having the families on good terms meant that he would see a faster track to the top. In the end, Jeff realized nothing about this plan had a damned thing to do with him and Randy becoming friends. It was just about his parents moving up the ladder again. At first, Jeff had refused. He was still in bed when his mother stopped her incessant humming long enough to tell him to get up and get dressed. Once he learned why, he told her no. No way in hell. However, his mother was a shrewd manipulator, and she'd know exactly what would get the job done. She promised Jeff that if he did this for her, went over and made it work with Randy, that Lou could come home the next day. She had sandbagged Jeff right into the corner with that one. He'd no choice but to agree. The morning was bright and beautiful, just as it had been when he and Lou had gone out exploring. Shelia pulled her car into Randy's driveway around noon. The house was much as Jeff had imagined. Large, beautiful, and no doubt very expensive. Shelia forced Jeff out first, made him go up to the porch and knock as she stood in the background smiling. Randy's mother answered the door. She was an attractive blonde woman that looked to be in her late thirties. Hi, you must be Jeff, she greeted. Jeff smiled wanly and confirmed that was in fact who he was. Hello, I'm Shelia Woods. Nice to finally meet you in person, Jeff's mother announced, barging past her son and extending a hand to Randy's mother. Shelia, so pleased to meet you. I'm Bridget Hayden. Sorry to hear that our boys had a little mishap the other day. You know how it is, though, with teenagers, hormones going crazy and all. Randy never gets into fights, but he explained to me that Jeff and his brother are still new to the area and haven't quite learned how we do things in Mandeville yet. Isn't that right, Jeff? Jeff knew that Bridget Hayden was baiting him to a degree. She wanted him to admit that he started it, admit that her piece-of-shit son was a perfect angel, and that Jeff and his wicked brother had clearly been at fault. He felt that lovely anger swim in his stomach, and once again imagined it as thick black syrup. However, he had to do this for Lou. He could only imagine how miserable his little brother was over at Aunt Marcy's, and if he could do something to rescue him from that fate, he'd do so. Still, Jeff couldn't resist a small jab. Yeah, sorry about that, Miss Hayden. Me and Lou had no idea that it was okay for your son and his friends to mess with our bikes without... scowl that appeared on Bridget Hayden's face. There was a moment of awkward silence when Jeff was worried that he'd perhaps gone too far and that the woman might send him away. However, Shelia was quick with a remedy. Bridget, he gets that mouth from his father. Never knows when to shut up. How about you and I go in and have some coffee and you can tell me all the great gossip around Mandeville while our boys get to know each other the right way? Randy's mom appeared to consider this for a split second before finally stepping back and allowing Jeff and Shelia to enter. 
Randy's in his room, Jeff, upstairs, second door to your left. I'm sure you'll hear the sound of his video games or something, Bridget stated with very little humor to her voice. Thank you, ma'am, Jeff answered, and entered the house. He could hear his mother and Bridget starting to talk as he climbed the stairs, heard the front door shut, and breathed a sigh of relief. He knew he shouldn't have said that, but still, what else could he do? He wanted to relish that sweet-flavored rage and was finding it harder and harder to resist it. He reminded himself once more that this was for Lou. He swallowed hard as he turned the corner of the second floor and found Randy's room. Jeff knocked and heard Randy answer with, Come in. Jeff opened the door and was struck for a second with Randy's bedroom. He had everything. Every game console, a huge flat-screen television, and enough crap on his shelves to fill a museum. He had various trophies and awards, as well as a huge stereo system hooked up. Randy was living the life, at least based on his possessions. Jeff's eyes then fell to Randy himself, sitting in a beanbag chair with an Xbox controller in his hands. Call of Duty was paused on the screen. Randy himself looked a lot less sinister than he had the other day. He was just a kid, a teenager around Jeff's age, wearing a white undershirt and blue sweatpants. He looked smaller now, just a child, not the criminal mastermind he thought himself to be. Jeff felt himself relax. Hey man, come on in, Randy invited and Jeff entered, shutting the door back behind him. Hey, so, I guess you heard, our parents want us to hang out. Get to know each other, Jeff stated with little conviction. Randy laughed, an honest laugh. No sarcasm detected. Yeah, that's my mom all right. She doesn't like drama. Honestly, I think she worries too much. I mean, I'm cool if you're cool. Jeff felt a sense of relief come in and replace that sickly sweet anger that had presented itself earlier. Perhaps Randy was all right. Perhaps they could move forward. Jeff sat down on the floor next to Randy and struck up a conversation. So, turns out your dad's my boss. He's freaking out about the fight in the parking lot. He was actually worried that he'd get fired or something. My dad is like everyone's boss. I fucking hate it. I think half the kids at my school talk to me because their parents are somehow connected to my dad's firm. Why do you hate it? Jeff asked. Because it's fake. This whole damn town is fake. You'll figure it out as you go, but trust me, everyone who lives here is just trying to pretend there's something else. My parents make me do all this shit, all the trophies and stuff, just so they can brag. That's it. Jeff smiled. I know how you feel. My dad had me in boxing class a year ago because some co-worker of his had a brother that worked at the place or something. As soon as that guy quit out, I was out of that gym the next week. I wish it was that easy. Randy responded, I hate playing baseball, but my dad will sure have me out there again next summer and the summer afterwards. It's like he knows I hate it, but wants to make sure I'm out there with his stupid company name on the back of my jersey. The conversation lapsed for a while as Jeff and Randy got lost in a game of Call of Duty. Things went well for a while. They laughed and joked as two friends would, but Jeff wanted to address the elephant in the room. Randy, why did you and your friends fuck with our bikes the other day? I told you, this town is fake and boring as shit. There's nothing to do here. We have to find stuff to do. I mean, there are only so many times you can go hang out at the video store or ride the dirt paths in the woods. All the girls here are stuck up. All the stores close early. There's no mall and the movie theater is across town. We were just bored, man. So sorry for that, I guess. Jeff was unsure how sincere Randy's apology was, but he was willing to go along with it. He wanted his brother home, and if he could actually mend fences with Randy, that would only serve to make his life easier come school year. It's cool, Jeff replied. I guess I'm sorry for it, too. Things went too far. You mean the fight? Randy asked. That shit was actually cool. Those guys, Keith and Troy... They just leech on because of my dad. It's like I told you, I'm pretty sure their parents make them hang out with me. The afternoon went on, and Jeff soon forgot that this was a mandatory arrangement. He actually started to find himself liking Randy. Sure, their first encounter was a little sketchy, but he was coming around to the guy. 
finding that he wasn't so bad once his idiot friends were removed from the equation. About an hour later, things took a new turn. Jeff heard the twin pops of two car doors shutting in near unison and then heard the engine start up. He dropped the game controller and peered out of Randy's bedroom window just in time to see his mother and Randy's mother backing out of the driveway. Our parents are leaving, Jeff said. About time. I figured my mom would eventually talk your mom into going shopping or going to get coffee or something like that. Jeff heard Randy pause the game. Hey Jeff, come downstairs. I want to show you some cool stuff. Randy invited, and Jeff followed. Randy led Jeff out to the garage. It was hot in there with the main door shut. The garage was well kept though, and Jeff observed stacks of magazines underneath the workbench, as well as tools and various other utility items stacked about. Standing in a small, closed-in garage with the late summer heat lingering about, Jeff began to feel a bit uneasy. Despite the fact that he and Randy had seemed to bond over the last few hours, Jeff couldn't ignore a sense that things were different now that the adults were gone. What did you want to show me? Jeff asked. Hold on, let me get it. Randy replied, moving the magazines out to reveal a small red box. Jeff watched as Randy removed the box and opened it. Check out my dad's flare gun, Randy announced and waved the red tubular gun about. Whoa, be careful with that, Jeff shouted, more out of shock than real concern. It's fine, dude, don't be a pussy. It's not even loaded, Randy corrected. However, Jeff watched as he fished one of the flares out of the back compartment. Randy then continued to fiddle with the flare gun, popping it open and loading a flare. Now it's loaded, he announced. My dad showed me how to use this last year when we went out boating. Sometimes I take it out back and shoot flares at trees, but maybe this time I don't need a tree. The change in Randy's voice and demeanor was impossible to ignore. Jeff realized that things were about to take a bad turn and tried to steer the situation in a different direction. Okay, well, cool gun. Let's go back in the house, though. It's, it's hot out here. Plus, I'm getting hungry. What do you have to eat? Jeff didn't bother waiting for a reply. He wanted out of that garage, honestly. He wanted out of Randy's house. He still wasn't sure what was happening here, but he had an undeniable feeling that nothing good would come. However, as Jeff turned to walk back through the small door leading back into the house, his path was suddenly blocked by two more familiar faces. Where are you going, Jeffrey? The fat kid Troy blurted out as he and Keith stepped forward into the garage. Took you two assholes long enough to get here. I've had to babysit this faggot all day, Randy shouted. A wicked joy was present in his words. Sorry, Randy, but Keith here had to mow his front yard before his parents would let him come out, Troy stated, a sheepish tone in his voice. It's cool. We're here now, Keith said. What the fuck is going on? Jeff asked, staring at Randy. He noticed that Randy still had the flare gun in his hands. I'll tell you what's going on, Jeff. You owe Keith and Troy an apology for what you did. You sucker punched him and then ran away. You didn't even have the balls to fight them fair. So now you're going to pay them what you owe? Randy explained. I'm not going to fight you, okay? I'm done with that shit. Jeff replied as he glanced about the room for an exit. You're right about that. You're not going to fight. You're going to stand there and let my boys get their licks in. Then I get mine. And when it's done, you get the fuck out of my house. I'll tell my mom that you got sick and walked home. After that, if you see us again, you better walk the other way. I'm not going to stand here and get hit by you or your friends. So just let me go home. How about that? I'll tell my mom that we're cool and everyone wins, okay? Jeff asked. Randy raised the flare gun towards Jeff. No. You stay, pussy. You stay and take your licks. Jeff felt that sensation once more. That sick rich, dark matter that swirled about inside of him. He could taste it now. It was heaven. In his mind, he imagined himself diving into it, swimming in it, letting it swallow him whole. He looked around and the sensation only grew. He saw Randy standing there holding the flare gun. It was limp in his hands though, and the hammer was not cocked back. Jeff knew that Randy had no intention of firing it. He looked over at Keith, skinny and pathetic, a kid born to follow. Troy, fat and sweaty, 
breathing a bit heavy from his walk over, and of course, in the middle of it all, Jeff himself. He felt that pleasure begin to mix with the rage, forming the perfect product. He tried to avoid sampling it. He knew that only regret could come from indulging in it. However, when it was placed so close, when the aroma and the promise of that sweet, savory flavor was only inches away, Jeff found that he could no more to stand against it than a ship in the ocean could stand against a typhoon. Jeff dropped his eyes to the floor. He snickered slightly. A quick laugh that was in fact devoid of any humor. He slowly raised his head back and locked his eyes with Randy and took a moment to enjoy the look of slight concern dawning on the boy's face. Jeff didn't even realize what was causing Randy's discomfort. He was just glad to see it. Why are you smiling at me? Are you queer for me or something? Randy asked, a slight nervous tinge in his voice. Am I smiling, Randy? I guess it's because I'm just having so much fun, Jeff announced, and suddenly lunged against the unprepared kid holding the flare gun. Jeff struck Randy once in the nose, feeling the satisfying crunch as the bridge of Randy's nose no doubt broke. Randy's arms dropped, yet he kept hold of the flare gun. Jeff, without even needing to look, realized that Troy and Keith had actually taken a step back instead of advancing as they should have. Jeff delivered another strong blow to Randy's jaw, causing the boy to drop to the floor. Jeff now turned his attention to Troy and Keith, the two tough kids that had yet to actually make so much as a move in his direction. Troy actually backed up a step and stumbled over the stack of magazines that Randy had moved earlier. Jeff took this opportunity and stepped forward, once again introducing Troy's round belly to his fist. Troy tried to stay on his feet, but Jeff's punches combined with the stumble over the magazines caused Troy to fall back, landing hard and striking his head on the concrete slab that was the garage's floor. Keith was actually trying to back away. However, Jeff was currently standing between him and the only exit to the garage since the carport door was closed. Jeff took two quick steps towards the skinny kid and felt the most intense joy at seeing Keith stagger backwards, knocking his back into the wall. That perfect blend of pleasure, control, and rage had come together. Jeff felt as though he were floating above the world. Somewhere in his mind, he knew there would be hell to pay for this, but at that exact moment in time, he couldn't care less. He didn't care about Lou. He didn't care about being arrested, and he didn't care if his dad got fired. All he cared about, in that fraction of time, was hurting Keith. Keith tried to make a run for it, hoping to squeeze through the small gap between Jeff and the door. However, Jeff clipped him. Jeff clipped him a hard right hand to his face, causing Keith to stagger back again. Jeff could see that his knees were buckling and took full advantage. He moved in, pinning Keith to the wall, and began to deliver blow after blow to the skinny kid's stomach. Keith's eyes became large as saucers. Once satisfied, Jeff stepped back and watched in demonic glee as Keith slowly slid down the wall, gasping for air. Randy was trying to get back on his feet and crawl backwards, away from Jeff, at the same time. Troy was still down, gripping his head and moaning. Keith had regained his breath, but seemed to be in no hurry to stand back up. Jeff simply stood in the center of it all, basking in the euphoric glory of his work. He felt like a god. Randy got back to his feet, but seemed to have no idea what to do. We done, Randy? We good? Or do you and your friends need more? Jeff mocked. No more! We're cool! Randy gasped. How about you assholes? Jeff asked, looking at the two boys who were still trying to decide if they should stand up or remain on the relative safety of the floor. It was Randy's idea, Keith said weakly. Yeah, man, we didn't even want to, Troy agreed. Fuck you both, Randy announced. The debate may have continued, but the sound of a returning car broke the tension. Oh shit, my mom's back! Randy shouted, his voice cracking in a humorous way. It seemed that the previous tough guy had all but shrunk back to a scared child. So we'll just say that we were all hanging out, Keith replied. No, the fucking flare gun. If she finds out that I messed with it, I'm screwed, Randy retorted, his voice full of nervous fear and anxiety. So put it back. 
Jeff suggested. That sensation of rage was fading again, and he felt control returning. Yeah, grab the magazines, please, Randy begged. Jeff found that he rather liked that tone. That begging, whipped dog mentality. Jeff bent down and began to pick up the magazines that Troy had knocked over. As he did so, Randy frantically attempted to open the flare gun's barrel once more to remove the flare loaded inside. He was fidgeting with it, and as he heard the two car doors slam shut, his terror became more intense, causing a lapse in motor skills. He could barely remember how to open it, although he had done it alone dozens of times. As his hand struggled to get the device to obey, his thumb slipped over the hammer, cocking it back and arming it. Jeff was paying no attention to this. He was down on the floor, calmly gathering the magazines. He didn't really care if Randy got in trouble or not. However, if his mother returned and found trouble, he feared that Lou may not be able to return home as promised. Everything else happened in a flash, both literally and figuratively. Randy, now in a panic over the trouble he'd be in if he was caught playing with the flare gun, had begun to sweat. His hands were slick with it. He didn't even notice that the gun was cocked. He was turning it over in his hands, trying to quickly disarm it. He then heard the sound of keys in the front door. He knew that he had only seconds now to hide it. Everything else happened in slow motion. The gun slipped from Randy's sweaty hands as he'd attempted to rotate it once more. He saw it fall to the floor, seeming to float to the ground rather than fall. Jeff, busy stacking the magazines, had only enough time to register Randy's shocked gasp. He turned to look in the boy's direction, just in time to see the bright red flare gun hit the floor. The gun discharged, launching a speeding ball of fire directly into Jeff's face. Jeff felt the hot flash of heat and pain tear across the left side of his face. After the initial registry of agony, there was no more thinking. Jeff began to scream clutching the left side of his face and rolling around on the floor. He wasn't aware of the panicked screams of the other three boys, nor was he aware of his mother running into the garage, followed closely by Randy's mother. He didn't hear the two women scream in shock and horror. He didn't hear anything over the sounds of his own wails of pain. The next few hours passed, for Jeff Woods like moments in a dream. He was aware of the intense burning on the left side of his face. He was somewhat aware that his left eye was no longer working, and he could smell what he believed to be his own hair burning. He could recall that. Then the ambulance arrived, and they stuck him with morphine, and for a while, he was in and out of awareness. If he forced himself to think about it, he could recall something that might have been his arrival to the hospital, but then more drugs had been given, and after that, everything was a blur. When he finally did come to a stable level of alertness, he realized he was in a hospital room. Half of his face was bandaged. He knew that much. He wanted to open his eyes and speak, let his family know he was awake, but the drugs still had a firm hold. He was awake, but not quite yet functioning. He debated simply going back to sleep when he heard the familiar voices of his mother, father, and brother. A fourth voice was present. And after a moment of listening in, Jeff ascertained that it was the doctor. Is he going to be okay, doctor? Jeff's mother asked. Oh, yes, ma'am. Your son will be fine. However, he will have a lengthy road to recovery and will need your support. The flare struck his face and caused third-degree burns on his left side. As you also know, his left eye was severely damaged. There are minor burns to his scalp, but we suspect that will repair naturally over time. It's the skin tissue on his face and his eye that we need to be concerned about. How bad is his eye? Jeff's father asked. Hard to say at this point. He'll need to see an optometrist for that. From what I can tell, though, he may never regain his vision in that eye. And his face? What about his face? Mother asked, sounding deeply concerned. Well, we were able to clean and treat the injury in time so you've no concern for infection or anything of that matter. We'll want him on antibiotics for a while, and he'll need to have the wound cleaned and dressed on a regular basis. But all in all, your son got very lucky. The damage could have been more severe. Jeff could hear his mother sigh in frustration. He was actually pleased that he hadn't yet announced his recovery. It brought him joy to hear his parents actually express concern over his well-being. It reminded him that perhaps they did care in the end. Doctor, 
his mother began again. What if there is permanent damage? What do we do about that? As I said, an optometrist will have to examine the eye. There may be surgical options, since the eye is still inflamed. It's difficult for us to really see the full... Sheila Woods interrupted the doctor, sounding more agitated than before. You're not listening. Not the eye, his face. What do we do to correct his face? She demanded. Well, ma'am, we have treated his face. Like I said, there shouldn't be a risk of infection so long as you... She cut him off again. Not the infection, his... his appearance. What can we do for that? Miss Woods, that's hardly a concern at this point. Once he is healed and back on his feet, you can possibly explore plastic surgery to repair some of the damage. But honestly, right now, we can't waste concern on how he looks. What is important is that your son is okay. He can expect to be back home in a few days, maybe sooner. Jeff's dad spoke again. Okay, thank you, doctor. Can we have some time alone, please? My wife and I need to speak. Certainly, the doctor replied. Lou, why don't you go down to the hospital cafeteria and get yourself a snack? Matt Woods suggested. But I want to be here in case Jeff wakes up, Lou replied. Lou, they told us that Jeff is heavily medicated. They don't expect him to wake up any time tonight, so just go. And if he does come around, we'll have you paged, Matt replied. Jeff recognized the voice tone, and he knew that if he could see his father's face right now, that look would make it apparent that he wasn't giving advice or making suggestions. He was trying to politely tell his youngest son to get the hell out of the room. Lou must have picked up on that, because Jeff heard the door opening close. His parents both let out a long, shaky sigh. But Jeff was starting to believe it was not a sigh of relief, but rather one of stress. We're going to have to homeschool him now, Matt. That's just what it's going to be. We're going to have to keep him home, he heard his mother rant, her voice sounding frantic. What? I mean, he probably won't be able to start school right on time, but I doubt he'll miss a whole year, his father responded, trying to maintain a calmer voice. I'm not talking about that, Matt. I'm not worried about him missing a week or two of school. I mean his face, Matt. You heard what the doctor said. His face is going to be disfigured, Shelia argued back. We don't even know the full extent of the damage yet, Shelia. It could be minor. It could possibly heal. And you heard what he said. Plastic surgery could be an option in time. In time? What kind of time? A year? Two years? And what about in the meantime? People are going to see him and they are going to talk. Is that what you want? He's going to be a... a pariah. You think anyone is going to want to have him around their kids? Jeff was hearing all of this, just letting it soak in. Slowly, as his mind absorbed the words, he felt that rage return. Sick, rich, dark, that syrup of raw, primal emotion. He wanted to scream at his mother, to tell her to shut up, that he was the one lying here, his face half burned, blind in one eye. All thanks to her forcing him to go over to Randy's house. He wanted to ask her why she left, why she went off to go shopping, or to have her nails done, or whatever it was that she did. He wanted to know why she'd leave him alone with a kid who just days before tried to jump him and his brother. He wanted to know how she could care more about his appearance than the fact that he was lying in the hospital. However, there was still so much more that he wanted to know as well. He wanted to know how much more his mother hated him, how much more she saw him now as a how did she put it? A pariah. He wanted to continue to swim in the thick pool of dark hatred that was starting to form with the rage and anger. That was a new one now. Before it was anger, then it was anger mixed with pleasure, but now it was anger mixed with hatred. And while he certainly longed to be free of it, while he most certainly preferred the false sense of love and concern he believed he'd heard from her before, he also wanted to test it out a bit more. He also began to wonder how well would this new recipe blend with pleasure? How would it feel? Matt Woods began to speak again. I just can't believe he shot himself in the face with a flare gun. I always thought Jeff was more responsible than that. Don't even get me started on that, Sheila replied. I couldn't believe it when Randy and his friends explained to the medics and police how it all happened. Randy was just trying to show Jeff around the house and wanted to show him the collection of magazines his dad kept in the garage. You know, boys, 
He was probably hoping that a couple of playboys would be in there or something. Then he said Jeff found the box containing the flare gun and just wouldn't stop playing around with it. You should have heard those other boys, Matt. They told me that they practically begged Jeff to just put it down before he got hurt. But he just had to show off. Makes you wonder what really happened in that parking lot now, doesn't it? I mean, is Jeff rebelling? What is this? Matt asked. I just don't know where we went wrong, Matt. I thought us moving out here to a nice, quiet neighborhood would make everyone happy. Jeff, though, he just... He just wants to fight us on everything. Matt and Shelia Woods continued talking a while longer. Though by then, Jeff had stopped listening. He had heard enough, though. Randy and his friends lied, put the blame on Jeff, and everyone, his own parents included, were just happy to go along and believe every word of it. Jeff would have bet money that Officer Williamson was on scene to take statements as well, to make sure that Randy, Troy, and Keith got in no trouble. Sure. Believe that Jeff shot himself. That works. Jeff didn't even have to wonder why no one asked why Randy's nose was swollen. The whole fight, Jeff being cornered in the garage, that would have been omitted. That makes for a nice, easy-to-file report, where no one that matters gets in trouble. And while all that came together in Jeff's mind, he continued to swim in that black ichor of hatred and rage. The morphine drip added a nice touch of euphoria. Jeff could almost see himself plunging into the syrupy waters of hatred and emerging changed. Each dip brought him so much twisted pleasure, and that was when he finally understood. He could sample the pleasure now. Not because he was enjoying what was happening, but because he knew he could enjoy what was to come. So, Jeff laid there, bandaged, feigning sleep, all the while allowing himself to dive deeper and deeper into that black pit within his mind. He began to fantasize, allowing his mind to go into horrible, dark places. In these fantasies, he made people suffer, his parents in particular. He felt that thrill trickle down his spine and settle in the base of his stomach. Randy, Keith, and Troy would get theirs in time, but first, First, Jeff wanted to take care of things at home. Just as the doctor had predicted, Jeff was scheduled to go home a few days later. During his time at the hospital, he never asked to see his face. It wasn't until the last day that he finally asked for a mirror. The nurse had come in to change his bandages, as was the routine. She was a pleasant woman. She spoke to him, asked him how he was doing. He enjoyed her visits. So on the final day, when she arrived to clean and dress his face, he asked to see himself. Are you sure, sweetheart? Would you like me to call in your parents first? She asked. No, thank you, Jeff replied. I think I want to see it for myself first, without them standing over me. I understand, she replied honestly, without a hint of pretension. Once the bandages were off, she handed him a small hand mirror. Would you like me to step out of the room? she asked. Jeff ignored her and looked at himself, taking stock of the damage. Sure enough, his face was a mess. The entire left side, at least. The flare struck him traveling upwards and burned a scar into his left cheek that extended to his eye. At first glance, it almost looked like he was smiling on that side. The scar was still bright red and burned tissue spread out on either side. Once it arrived at his eye, the news did not get any better. His eye was white, just a lifeless bulb plugged into his face. He closed his right eye and found that he could see nothing from his left eye at all. The scar continued up the left side of his forehead. The damage was less severe there, however. The hair on the left side of his head was burned off, leaving a few strands to stick up here and there. Jeff reached up and touched the left side of his face and found that he felt nothing at all. He went back to staring at himself in the mirror, never looking back up at the nurse. This went on for almost 15 minutes, when she finally had to replace the bandages. Sorry, sweetie, but I have to put clean bandages on, she told him. Jeff smiled. It's okay. There will be plenty of time for me to admire myself later. A few hours later, Jeff was back home. The hospital had sent his family home with plenty of gauze and other creams and ointments. He also had painkillers and antibiotics that he'd have to take for a while. 
Still, though, he would live. There was no joy from his parents on the ride home or upon arrival. They spoke very little, and there was a tension in the car that simply wouldn't fade. As for Lou, he was thrilled that his brother was okay, but he didn't know what to say concerning the damage to his face. So, after asking a few questions about the accident and the recovery, he fell silent as well. The Woods family arrived home after the sun had begun to set. They walked in and Lou asked about dinner. He suggested they let Jeff pick a place to celebrate his return home. Just go to sleep, both you boys. Go to sleep, Sheila remarked. She and her husband both retreated to their bedrooms as well to argue or feel sorry for themselves. Who knew? Jeff and Lou didn't speak much that night. Jeff spent most of the evening staring at himself in the mirror. He kept pulling back the bandages and looking at the scars. Lou wanted to see them too, but felt that it might be imprudent to ask. I'm glad you're home, Jeff. I really missed you, and I'm glad you're okay, Lou said to Jeff as he stared at himself. I'm not okay, Lou, and neither are you. None of us, really. There is a sickness here. The only difference is... Now my sickness shows on the outside as well, Jeff replied, his voice as flat as that of an answering machine. What are you talking about? Lou asked. One day, you'll see it too. This is what happens, though. This is what happens when it all falls down, Jeff said, still peeking behind his bandages. Jeff, I don't know what you're trying to say, Lou responded. Jeff didn't reply, though and after several moments, Lou left him alone. Lou went down to his parents' bedroom and knocked on the door. What is it? The voice of his mother asked. Mom, I think Jeff is acting weird. You may want to come talk to him, Lou suggested. Go away, Lou. Leave your mother alone, his father's voice answered. Lou, being young, had no other ideas, so he returned to his own bedroom. He didn't know that those would be the last words he'd ever hear his parents speak to him. That night, Shelia and Matt Woods awoke together. Both being light sleepers, it took little to bring them out of slumber. The sudden removal of their blanket, as it was snatched from the bed, did the trick just fine. They awoke to see a small light coming from the half-bath that was situated in their master bedroom. The door was cracked only slightly, and the light source was weak. They could make out a human shape, standing over their bed. What? What's going on? Shelia grumbled as their vision came into focus. They realized their son was standing before them. Matt reached over and flipped on the lamp next to their bed. Jeff was standing there, his bandages off, his disfigured face beaming down on them with a long kitchen knife clutched in his right hand. What are you doing, son? Matt asked, his mind still trying to shake out the cobwebs of sleep. He's got a knife! Shelia screamed, grabbing at her husband's arm. Matt kept his composure, though. Shelia, it's probably the painkillers. He likely got up and got disoriented. Relax, for Christ's sake. Jeff tilted his head to one side. Still not speaking, he stared hard at his father, slowly bringing the knife up, ensuring that he saw it well. Son, what are you doing? Matt asked. Scaring you, Jeff replied with no emotion in his voice. Matt, do something, Shelia pleaded. Okay, son, I realize that you've been through a lot, but you need to go back to bed. I'm going to call the doctor in the morning and... Jeff moved quickly across to his father's side of the bed, his head moving about alternating between a normal-looking young man and the deformed ghoul that had been lurking in the shadows. Okay, son, you've scared me. Is that what you wanted? Matt asked, adjusting to the middle of the bed to put distance between himself and his son. Good. Now I can start hurting you. Jeff spoke again, with no emotion. His father had time to utter a single syllable, most likely to ask another question. To try and reason with his son. Jeff, however, gave him time to do no more than that. He lunged onto the bed, driving the knife into his father's stomach. Matt attempted to fend Jeff off, but the wound to his midsection rendered him into shock, and his arms fell to the side. 
Jeff could hear his mother screaming, but paid no mind. He wanted to finish with his father first. Removing the knife, Jeff stabbed down into his stomach three more times quickly. His father gasped and coughed up blood. His body jerked and twitched each time the knife found its mark. After the third time, Matt Woods lay still. Shelia had backed up against the headboard of the bed. She wanted to climb down, make a run for it, but she had balled herself up between the headboard and the end table. In her frantic state of terror and confusion, she couldn't figure out how to do something as simple as dismount a bed. Jeff, why are you... why are you doing this to us? She asked feebly. Randy started it. You must have known that. But you ignored it. Lou had a busted lip. You must have seen that. But you ignored it. I was shot in the face with a flare gun. But you believed Randy. Why? So you could fit in? Jeff asked in a low, almost growling voice. No, baby. I believed you. It was just your father's job. And we're new here. And, oh, God, Jeff, please. His mother begged. Tell me about homeschool, Mom. Tell me about how you don't want to send me out in public because of my face. Tell me how none of the other kids will want to be my friend, and how none of their parents will want to be yours. Tell me about that, Mom. Tell me how nice it's going to be, you homeschooling me. Jeff, please. I was just stressed. I was worried about you. That's all. P please. I... I love you. Mom, I think you should take your own advice. You know, what you told Lou when we got home tonight. He wanted to do something nice to welcome me home. And do you remember what you told us to do instead? Jeff asked as he now crawled over, cornering his mother on the bed. What did I say? She asked, the question coming out barely a whisper. Go to sleep. Jeff snarled and drove the knife into his mother's chest. He stabbed her over and over again, and as he did, he finally found that perfect recipe, that heavenly blend, that rage, hate, and pleasure all mixed into one perfect formula. And for a while, Jeff became lost in it all. Jeff opened his brother's bedroom door, not surprised to find his brother asleep. He had dozed off with headphones in, so he slept through all the shouting. That was fine with Jeff. It was easier that Lou not have to hear all of that. Jeff sat down on his brother's bed and nudged him slightly. It took a moment, but Lou finally opened his eyes and looked up. Jeff removed his earphones for him. You're free now, Lou. He spoke softly. Jeff, what? What are you talking about? Lou mumbled, still half asleep. You'll see in the morning. I just wanted to let you know I love you. You've been my best friend. Remember that, okay? Thanks. I, I love you, too. Now let me get back to sleep. Lou replied, already dozing off again. Jeff smiled and stood up. As he left the room, he looked back at his sleeping brother one last time before he vanished into the night. Concluding the Story When Jeff completed his story, Rosenberg had smoked almost half his pack of cigarettes as the butts laid about the base of the chair. During that time, he'd not moved and barely blinked. The figure sitting on the counter before him had also never moved besides speaking. And now the story was told, and for a moment, both people occupying the small tent remained silent. There was one more victim, though. The cop, right? Yeah. I went after Williamson. He was corrupt and would always be corrupted. I owed him for that. Had he done his job, gone after Randy the first time, who knows, maybe none of this would be happening, Jeff answered. And it was the cop's son that got your picture? He snapped it as you were leaving the scene, that picture that's now famous all over the place, Rosenberg confirmed. Yes, I suppose that makes him the world's most famous photographer right now, doesn't it? Jeff replied sarcastically. So, what happens now, Jeff? I told you at the start, I don't know. All I know 
now is that I'm drowning in it, and I'm not sure if I ever want to be pulled out. Drowning in what, Jeff? The reporter asked. The ichor. The syrup. Whatever you want to call it. When I killed my parents, it swallowed me whole. I think I stabbed my mother at least fifty times, he replied. Seventy-six, according to the reports, Rosenberg corrected. I guess I lost count. And you know, I want to feel guilty. I want to feel bad for killing them. But that syrup, like I said, I'm fully submerged. I can't feel anything except that sensation of hateful joy. I don't know if I'll ever be able to feel anything else, and I don't know if I want to, Jeff stated. So now, what do you do, Jeff? Keep running? You can't run forever. You must realize that, right? No. I still owe Randy and his pals a visit. I have to make that right. Afterwards, I don't really have a plan. I guess whatever happens will happen. Well, I guess that concludes this, then. I mean, what else can we say? I have to get back home, so... No. The police will likely show up soon. You forgot something. You didn't send out your little texts, Jeff said, sounding almost regretful. Oh, shit. I got so caught up in your story, I guess, and... Well, Jeff jumped down from the counter and began to walk towards Rosenberg. Don't blame yourself, Mr. Rosenberg. Blame the Iker. It's just so, so delicious. Jeff snarled and drew a knife from his jacket as he closed in. Shortly after, the police arrived. They received a call from a woman in New Orleans named Monica Davenport, stating that her employer had gone out on a tip that he thought he knew the location of Jeff the Killer. When the police arrived at the closed-down fireworks tent, they found the body of Benny Rosenberg, apparently murdered by multiple stab wounds. He had a revolver in his right hand, however, investigator reported that he had never had a chance to fire it. Two weeks passed and life returned to normal for Monica. She, and along with the rest of the staff of Nola Watch, attended Rosenberg's funeral. Tears were shed, flowers were dropped, and at the end of it all, life returned to normal. However, Things changed when Monica arrived for work on Monday. A package was waiting for her. She opened it, finding only a small cassette tape contained within. She played it and sat in silent shock for almost an hour as she listened to her former boss's final words, all the way to the end as the sounds of flesh being pierced could be heard over Rosenberg's screams. She played the tape again before notifying the police, who came and picked it up from her. Of course, she'd copied the audio contents before handing over the original. She was still a journalist, and intended to be the first to go public with the only existing interview with the now famous Jeffrey Woods. She found herself listening to it over and over again throughout the week, though, as she prepared her piece to print. The entire story was horrific, and the death of Rosenberg did nothing to relieve the pure morbidity of the ordeal. However... It was Jeff's final words as he walked from the tent that haunted her the most. She listened to them again and again. Once you swim in the hate, the rage, the pleasure, you can never get out. It swallows you up and keeps you there with an anchor that cannot be escaped. Yourself. The scent of gunpowder and rust overwhelmed my airway as my mother fell over the top of my crib. My lungs screamed with terror as the doll in my crib re-cocked the gun. This time, my dream self was able to do something about it. All I could hear through my screams was the internal voice of Uma Thurman, wiggle your big toe. That's just what I did, inching the maniacal entity towards me and away from my mother, now slouched and bleeding on the floor. She. It may have been an absolute asshole, but I was still at least five to ten times its size. As terrified as I was, I attempted to wrench the gun from her nubby hands. After holding it so tightly, it let the gun go too damn fast. 
A burst exploded in my ears, and the smell of gunpowder refreshed itself as if on an air freshener timer. The color of crimson bloomed through my shirt in a perfect circle as pain consumed my chest. Then I woke up. Society, psychology, and even grade school teachers dictate that we shouldn't play favorites. I mean, sure, inanimate objects are fine. Songs, TV shows, ice cream flavors, etc. But it's common knowledge that it's not nice to have favorite parents, grandparents, children especially, and so on. If someone has a favorite, that could leave open to interpretation to mean everyone else isn't good enough. However, as we know, it's all bullshit. Everyone has a favorite person, and I was my mother's. I don't mean that she loved me more than other children. That went without saying. The point I'm trying to make is that she preferred me over everyone. More than lovers, mentors, family members, etc. Sadly, I resented her for it. While she wanted to recreate our own little version of Grey Gardens, I wanted a life for myself. After all, that was the natural order of things. Women have children and raise them to have families of their own someday. Something that seemed worse than a death sentence to my mother Livy. I'm sure in the back of her mind she wanted happiness for me. She wasn't a bad mother, after all. I think losing my dad really got to her. From what I was told, she was six months pregnant with little old me when she opened the door to two solemn-looking deputies one day. She said the pit of dread she felt reached all the way inside the pit of her soul when she saw them. They confirmed her worst fear. My father had been found dead. Police explained what had happened, but my mother was in such shock that it took her days to understand it. My dad was on a job to repossess a vehicle when he ran into a man at the end of his rope. The man pleaded with my father for just three more days with the vehicle to no avail. It turned out the man was at the end of a two-day run with the law. He fled the scene of a hit and run in the very car my father was supposed to repossess. I guess he hadn't had time to properly clean it to destroy the evidence. The man had been fighting with whether or not to turn himself in the entire night before, and my father's presence was the final sign. In the inevitability of the situation, the man became desperate and pulled a gun. My mom didn't know if the shot was intentional or just the result of jittery hands from adrenaline. But in the end, the result was the same anyway. And of course, as these things do, I was born almost the spitting image of him. My mother resolved to hold on to the only living piece of him she had left, and that was that. Some of my fondest childhood memories were the picnics she used to take us on. She used to sit on the ground with me, leaning over me to smother me with tickles so light they felt like drizzles of rain. Her hair would fall around me, consuming me in the scent of honeysuckle and strawberry. My mother was my perfumed superhero. Normal children had stuffed animals or blankets to bring them comfort, but for me, my mother's scent was home. Years of formative childhood flew by before I realized that my mommy was different from other mommies. All of my friend's mother's smiles reached their eyes, while mine didn't. She became rigid, with visible discomfort when I played with other children. I don't mean that she was a helicopter mom. I mean that she got this look on her face like she'd stepped on a banana peel stuffed with cat shit or something. She'd never let me attend sleepovers or hold them at the house. Not only that, she would cry about not wanting to be alone when I asked her to go to simple things, like birthday parties, even if they were in the most public of places. It wasn't long before I realized that though she loved me, she was more afraid of being alone than she was of my safety. I didn't judge her for it. From what it sounded like, she had a hard life before I came along. My mother was an enigma to most, a nightmare to some, and a joy to me. As far as nightmares go, though, there was no one she hated more than Bobby Harlow. She didn't waste a single opportunity to let him know that either. We met in community college, the one thing my mother couldn't manage to keep me from. I'd managed to work pretty much everything out as far as my mother went, until he went and fell in love. He asked her for my hand in marriage, hoping to impress me. I wish to God he hadn't. I mean, yeah, the sentiment isn't lost on me, but who the hell does that? 
This entire, and I mean entire, situation likely could have been avoided if we just said fuck everything and married like everyone else did. God damn it. I wanted to hit him when I found out what he had done. You can imagine my mother's surprise. She hadn't even known I'd been dating anyone. Not only did she tell him no, she also threatened him, completely false, of statutory rape due to him being two grades ahead of me. If she did call the police, they'd probably laugh in her face. Still though, it's not the type of thing to say lightly. Bobby certainly didn't appreciate being called a rapist just for wanting to get married. So we did what we should have done in the first place, with the damage already done in spades. I moved out, leaving my mother alone and heartbroken. Things went well enough until the sexual frenzied phase wore off. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I said or did something, and Bobby just up and left that day. He said whatever I had done was something identical to my mother. He said that thoughts haunted him all day long about our future together as an older couple and me just pecking him apart like a crow to a rotting eyeball. I didn't hear much from him after that, until eventually all contact fell away completely. I was left alone, with too much shame and embarrassment to go back home to the mother that needed me. Days turned into weeks that turned into months. When I woke up at 8.13 that fateful Wednesday morning, I knew something was wrong. The house was eerily silent, robbing all sound of its innocuous safety. My body was swathed in a sticky, cold sweat, and I was surprised to find my heart hammering wildly. I hadn't awoken from a night terror, not that I recalled anyway. My muscles ached to spring into unknown motion for an event I wasn't yet aware of. It wasn't much of a shock at first when my phone rang. My mother's nurse Janet's voice drifted solemnly through the line. I found myself responding politely, as if on a business call, completely emotionless. The gravity didn't hit me until a moment or so after the line disconnected. I sank to my knees with heartbreak, allowing myself to succumb to the feelings. I hadn't thought about my mother dying much, and I certainly wasn't ready to accept it. After all, she was always larger than life to me. I always thought I would have more time. I fantasized about long overdue conversations and apologies that now I never get to experience. Grief and nostalgia brought out the brightest colors of our happiest memories, leaving the dysfunction to fall away to shadows in the forgotten night. I suppose that's the way it goes sometimes, though. It's the same reason women give birth more than once. You take the beauty out of the experience to forget the pain. Janet had come to the house at 7.30 to make my mother breakfast and administer her medication as she had for the last eight months. My mother would normally already be awake and in her lifting recliner by the time she walked in, except for that day. That day, Janet opened the door to a dark and silent house. My mother didn't have any pets. She never really had now that I think about it. I think it's something to do with the inevitability of her having to outlive them. She always demanded control over when people departed her life. <laughs> Imagine the irony in that. But she noticed an odd smell. She thinks my mother died on her way back into the bedroom from using the bathroom at night. That's when the dream started. It's only natural, right? I sure as shit had unresolved issues left over from childhood, along with 89% of the rest of the world. My hormones have been completely unbalanced, so that adds another factor. Finally, my mother just died. Whether we had a great relationship or not, the death of a matriarch causes some type of feeling. The oceans that were once our family had changed, sending ripples off in unknown paths with new patterns. I would be small and frozen, utterly paralyzed with fear contained behind bars. It took me longer than I'd like to admit to realize that I was in a baby's crib. My subconscious mind has shrunken me back to my younger days, stuck me somewhere between infancy and toddlerhood, and I felt absolutely everything. The dreams were always more realistic than things that happened in my waking life. Colors, textures, smells, it was all accessible to me. Eventually, I was even able to recognize the room I was in as the one we lived in when I was a young child. 
the pink and white cloud wallpaper became covered in blood spatter as I watched the first shot tear clean through the side of my mother's face. Her body slumped over the side of the railing, over top of me immediately after and remained locked in place like a defeated afghan draped over the back of an old chair. Sputters and gags erupted through my tiny lips as tendrils of the dark hair I once was so in love with trailed down my throat. Frustration thrummed through my being as my brain sent orders that my body wasn't able to accommodate yet. My mother, the only caretaker I'd known, was in danger, and I was rendered powerless to stop it. And that bit you read earlier? That was no mistake. The attacker in my dream was a sentient doll. You know, the type that's heavily lashed eyes close when you tilt their heads back, only it was fully functional. Each plastic digit moved separately on inner command. It had a trifecta of curls painted below its hairline that bared a striking resemblance to three sixes, as cliche as that sounds. It's not that I was afraid of them, mind you. Everyone has mortal fears and silly ones. For example, it's much more reasonable to be scared of drowning in the ocean than it is to fear, say, frogs. Even the most mature mind holds the silliest of fears. My best friend Melody was always afraid of dolls and clowns. Now, being scared of clowns has become a valid fear, thanks to Mr. Gacy and the clown trends that came in the 2000s. But, besides being visually unsettling to some, dolls can't really hurt you. Also, I'd always wake up in a different place than where I'd fallen asleep. Whatever the reason, it all seemed to act as some kind of warning, a foreboding to something that was just out of my conscious grasp. But what? I'd never had recurring dreams before, especially not ones so vivid. Like I said before, my mental conditions were ripe for it, I guess. Still though, each time the dream occurred, a new piece of it would unfold. I'd been provided another puzzle piece of my subconscious in each subsequent dream. I found myself spending my waking moments disturbed, dreading what would be revealed next. Did I carry guilt for leaving her behind? Was that what all this was about? These types of questions plagued me all the way through her funeral. I held a stoic stance as they delivered the eulogy. It was odd to hear the pastor speak so much about my mother when he hardly knew her. Everyone's their best selves at church. My resolve was solemn but strong. That is, until they closed the casket lid. A sliver of her face remained visible from my vantage point just before the wooden tomb sealed around her. My stomach was seized with panic and I found my heart rate increasing faster than I had time to process. Tingles invaded my sinuses seconds before I felt the tears come, and then I fell apart. Normally I would have been embarrassed, I hate drawing attention to myself, but hell, I was her only living relative. It would look terribly out of place if I didn't cry. People gave sympathetic stares and murmured platitudes for healing, but I couldn't hear them. A kind-faced woman I didn't recognize swept me up in a one-armed hug. The gesture took me almost completely off guard. I was almost sure I'd never met her before in my life. Her other arm was at her side, holding the hand of a little girl, which, judging by her features, was undoubtedly her daughter. I backed away, after allowing myself an appropriate amount of solace in a stranger's comfort, and wiped my eyes dry as I gave the child a smile. I couldn't help but notice she'd brought a baby doll, even dressed it in black for Christ's sake. And guess which kind of doll it was. Go ahead, I'll wait. That's right. One of those rosy-cheeked fuckers with the movable eyelids. Only it seemed to be broken. The eyes moved completely separate from one another. As stupid as it sounded, the thing seemed to be winking at me, like it knew all about the night terrors and what they meant. Completely unhinged by the entire situation, my body began to shake. I sunk to my knees and clamped my hands over my ears as a scream of terror rang through the air. It was so loud that it hurt my own lungs. I didn't realize that I was the one screaming until everyone was staring at me. I shouldn't have done it. I know I shouldn't have done it. But I did. I ran to that darling little girl, grabbed her doll, and threw it into the open grave. A thud rang through the atmosphere as its plastic body hit the wooden lid. My feet raced around to the other side of the burial plot before her mother could stop me and began throwing handfuls of dirt and mud on top of the casket. 
My hands flew voraciously with hand after handful of dirt, determined to bury the damn doll where it lay. Eventually, two sets of hands were brave enough to grab me from behind and drag me away from the ceremony, where I collapsed gratefully in a fresh fit of tears. I spotted the little girl and her mother a ways off in the cemetery, and my heart sank with guilt as I watched the little girl cry hysterically. Her mother shot daggers at me as she ran her hand back and forth over her daughter's back in an effort to soothe her. I looked to the man on my right as I reached into the pocketbook inside of my purse and pulled out some cash. My fingers smudged brown along the crisp green paper as I handed it to the gentleman. Please, I pleaded softly. Give this to the girl's mother with my deepest apologies. I'm not well, and probably gave that little child a lifelong fear of funerals and graveyards. He nodded sympathetically as he agreed to my grief-laden request. I stayed just long enough to make sure he approached her, then spun on my heel and left. I was done with crying. Done with all the people. Done with the outdoors. Done with all of it. The small of my back ached as I straightened up to assess the total clusterfuck that had once been my mother's clean living room. It was littered with things left behind from a woman who was the queen of sentimental hoarding. She could be eating out and see a pretty bird in the sky and keep a napkin from the damn place for the next 20 years. I'd almost filled an entire garbage bag with utter and complete bullshit when I heard the whimpers drift down from upstairs. A cold sweat of dread broke out across my neck and shoulders as I carefully ascended the stairs. This wasn't supposed to be happening, I thought in terror. Not now, at least. I froze in the doorway, keeping careful not to be seen while peering inside. I knew if I made my presence known and achieved eye contact, it was all over. The sounds grew louder as my stomach filled with the acid of anxiety. Nevertheless, I took a deep breath, thrust open the door to my mother's spare bedroom, and plastered the largest fake smile on my face imaginable. There she was, limbs jerking wildly as she struggled to figure out the complexities of her motor skills. Hello there, I cooed. Did you have a good nap, baby? I picked up my daughter Chloe tenderly, lamenting at how much heavier she was getting every day. Pretty soon, you won't be my little baby anymore, I thought sadly. Yep, that's right, I had a baby. I'd found myself in almost the exact same situation as my mother. Only Chloe's father was alive and well. He was driven away by enough hatred for mom that even the love and promise of new life wasn't enough for him to stay. And co-parenting would only increase the exposure to my mother's insults, along with sealing the inevitability that he basically married her incarnate. That's why I thought I was moving rooms in my sleep. At first, I thought it was an unspoken maternal instinct. Maybe I walked in my sleep to be closer to Chloe. We had only been in this new space for a short time, and our rooms were vastly far apart from each other. I'm ashamed to admit, especially now, that I hadn't exactly told my mother very much about the baby. In some way, I'm sure she knew all about her, though. We lived in an incredibly small town, not far from where she lived. In hindsight, I should have just let her have her way. It's not as if Bobby stuck around, not that I could blame him. And if that experience taught me anything, it was that I did not need to be in a relationship. Another man was the last thing I wanted. Nope, Chloe had undoubtedly become my favorite person, just like I was my mother's. Even though I knew I wouldn't be all that she needed, she was certainly enough for me. But yeah, I should have just moved back in with mom and we could have all formed a mother-daughter cult. Then everyone would be alive and happy, right? Please God, somebody tell me I'm right. It suddenly occurred to me that maybe the dream signified something else entirely. Perhaps my own feelings of inadequacy as a new parent were bleeding into my REM sleep like liquid into a paper towel. The following morning, I awoke with a start followed by an intense pain in the side of my neck and shoulder. It took me a few seconds to absorb the familiar surroundings. The pink carpeting slid between my fingers as I rolled onto my side. I had already dreaded the pain I knew would accompany my rise to my feet, but I guessed it was inevitable. I slapped at my forehead, 
surprised by a slight tickle and unwelcome bead of liquid caused as it rolled into my eyes. My vision was overwhelmed with patches of crimson as I struggled to wipe the mess away. Torrents of tears invaded my already wet eyes as I followed the trail of red across the floor to the corner of the room. The once white bars of Chloe's crib were marred with red smears. Those eight steps across her room seemed to take an eternity. I began to choke on my sobs, unable to keep an even breathing rhythm through horror-robbed lungs. Gobs of spit flew from my lips as I started to scream. You see, in my dream that night, I had finally turned a corner. I was able to not only overcome my terrified paralysis, but beat the doll. I ripped it limb from limb with maniacal glee as the pops of an arm being ripped from its socket. I stared into the crib, expecting to see a jumbled mass of plastic. However, that's not what I saw at all. There was so much blood present that I could barely tell what was what. My mother always wanted to be the only person in my life, ever since before I was born. It seemed that she was sure to get her way. It was supposed to be a dream, the conclusion to a series of terrifying nightmares manifested by unresolved feelings about my mother's death. Only the dream wasn't really a dream. And the doll wasn't really a doll. Have you ever heard of sleep paralysis? Sleep paralysis is a condition that causes people to be unable to move either when falling asleep or waking up. It is often accompanied by night terrors and particularly vivid nightmares, all of which can be more than a little disturbing when you find yourself at your most vulnerable and unable to react. Its physical causes remain a mystery, but the condition is sometimes directly related to psychological factors such as built-up stress. I suppose it shouldn't have been much of a surprise that the torment that haunted my early teenage years returned when I moved to a rundown suburban neighborhood in Louisiana. The block I lived on was a textbook example of the frenzied building of the late 90s that led to the subsequent housing crisis. Prices plummeted quickly when the builders realized no one wanted to live near a bog, miles away from any major city. To me, however, it was perfect. Being a web designer meant I could work from home, and although it took a while to get used to using mosquito nets, the house, for its asking price, was a real bargain, and included a porch, a garage, and even a space in the attic that I planned to transform into a home theater and game room. It also allowed me to set my studio and bedroom apart, and provided me with extra space if friends wanted to drop by. Fresh out of college and ready to get on with working, it promised to be everything I could wish for except that it had been so poorly maintained. I'm not talking about superficial, easy-to-fix stuff. Either the soggy paint and weed-infested porch I could take care of myself, but the multiple leaks and crackling wiring represented a whole different sort of beast. Fortunately, my parents came over and some really nice neighbors volunteered to help, probably happy to see a fresh face amongst the row of empty houses. Even the local pastor came by a chubby little man who served ours and three other equally deserted parishes and did his best to keep the small, nearby church from falling into ruin. By the end of the month, my home looked as gorgeous as it could ever be. After several weeks of continuous home repairs and working at my computer, both almost non-stop, and in spite of the clearly friendly, welcoming community, the stress and exhaustion hit me hard. The first night it happened, I woke up in a sweat, as if startled by a distant scream that faded away the moment I regained consciousness. Trying to switch on the light, I found my arm immobilized, buried beneath a tide of blankets that might as well have been made of lead, trapping all my limbs beneath its crushing embrace. I sighed. Not this again. You know that Henry Fuseli painting that depicts a young maiden laying on her bed with a fat, piggish imp sitting over her? The nightmare, I think it's what it's called. That's what this felt like. A nightmare that's absolutely terrifying as it hits you before you have any idea what's going on. However, I was already what you might call a veteran at this stuff, 
and as soon as I recognized it for what it was, I tried my best to go back to sleep before I wasted an hour looking at the ceiling wishing I could go back to sleep. I tried counting sheep, trying to mentally solve complex math while forgetting half the numbers, you know, the usual tricks. At last, after a relentless battle, I finally fell into a listless slumber and woke up just as tired as I had been when I laid down. One of the things that makes each sleep paralysis condition unique is its frequency. The luckier of those afflicted will suffer from the condition only once and are then free from it for the rest of their lives, while others, it's a monthly occurrence. My case is fairly peculiar in that it rarely raises its ugly head, but when it does, it comes on full force in strings of consecutive episodes spanning weeks. Well acquainted with the pattern, I expected another restless night. One of the few productive things I did that day was tilting my window blind slightly so I would be able to spy the magnificent view of chipped paint and overgrown bushes that filled the horizon. All humor aside, this was a trick I'd come up with as a teen. It helped me to cope with my problem. Poster worthy or not, any view during one of my nighttime episodes was better than complete blackness. And, being an early riser by nature, the morning sun wouldn't bother me at all. Nothing unusual happened that night, and I was relieved to wake up refreshed and ready to make up for everything I should have done the day before. Still, I was experienced enough to know that one good night didn't mean the cycle was over. I was careful to not overwork myself. I figured there was a good chance I'd need to conserve some strength. The paralysis did, however, return as certain as nighttime itself. So there I was again, frozen in my bed, at least this time with enough light in the room to be able to see exactly what time it was. The clock read 3.32 a.m. Not a pleasant surprise, but things could have been worse. The faster I fell back to sleep, I thought, the more rested I'd feel in the morning. Between the blinds, I watched as streetlights projected yellow shapes onto the dirty white walls of the nearby houses giving ghoulish life to swaying tree branches. I was moments from closing my eyes when something else caught my attention. It was a silhouette of a man or a woman, I couldn't tell, making its way through our empty streets in the dead of night. I remember thinking how odd it was for someone to be out this late, particularly an elderly person as the heavy, limping stride seemed to indicate. Although I am not typically the type to stick my nose in other people's business, I couldn't help but spy on this figure as it passed. I had nothing better to do, was unable to move, and knew too well that my night's slumber was already ruined. In considering the state my own home had been in when I bought it, it wouldn't have come as any surprise to me if someone was out there now for the express purpose of looting the vacant, unsold houses. The stranger, however, did nothing out of the ordinary and would have been completely unremarkable if it weren't for the fact it was after 3 a.m. and that he was alone and on my street. Slowly shuffling, the shadowy figure made his way through the neighborhood, passing a little too close, I thought, to the front of my house before merging with the night and disappearing from my line of sight again. Maybe I was making too much out of it, I thought. Perhaps it was just some old eccentric, every town's got one, or some drunk rambling around after downing a bottle or two. But my concerns began to grow when the exact same thing happened during my paralysis the next night. After an uneventful day during which I tried to relax and set work aside in order to regain some stability, I woke up this time at exactly 3.22 a.m. I watched the same figure again pass my house before vanishing into the darkness. He, I found myself assuming that it was a he, had to be up to something. I couldn't see his face in the shadows of the streetlights, obscured as it was by what appeared to be a wide-brimmed hat. I tried to remember if any of my neighbors had a limp leg, but no one came to mind. I wasn't surprised, though, and reasoned that I had yet to meet everyone who lived on my street. Much of the population had made themselves scarce, and for all I knew, someone could have fallen and hurt himself in the weeks since the initial flurry of welcome to the neighborhood visits. The day and night that followed went smoothly, without anything worthy of mention. 
I did ask around, though, as inconspicuously as possible, to see whether anyone knew of someone who resembled the man I saw during the late night crisis. No one had any clue who or what I was talking about. By the end of the day, I feared my neighbors had me pegged as an unhinged lunatic. That night was when I started to notice the stuff that didn't fit with the it's just a limping neighbor theory. As I'd expected, the man returned at his usual hour, went on his usual walk, and took his usual path. Exactly the same path. I mean literally. He stopped to catch his breath near the third house down the road, cocked his head slightly as he crossed the empty asphalt, and then tripped, nearly falling over when he got to the intersection. It was impossible, but I swear that if I had counted his steps, I would have found that he took the exact same number of them every night. As soon as he disappeared, I gasped in shock and brought my hand to my mouth. The sleep paralysis was gone. I got up and went straight to the window, lifting the sash and sticking my head out to see if I could catch a glimpse of the shadow skulking away. Nothing. He had disappeared and along with him the invisible force which had held me down. Suffice it to say, I was both intrigued and disturbed by what had happened and was quite certain it hadn't been a nightmare. Sleep was now out of the question. I contemplated calling a friend of mine, a self-professed expert in all things paranormal, but realized it was far too late in the day. As a result, I had just one option left. I jumped online and posted my experience on various paranormal boards, hoping my story would remain visible amidst the countless phony ghost pictures that flooded the forums. My post got a better response than I had expected. Eh, there were the typical trolls who joked about it being Blair Witch 3, but maybe that was why one user suggested to me that I should videotape the evidence and post it to be reviewed by other posters. I didn't know what else to do, so I obliged, and the following night my camera was set up, facing towards the street. I started the tape recording at midnight on the dot. Sure enough, the stranger showed up again, and I swear went through exactly the same motions again. When it was over and I was able to get up, still a bit heavy on my legs but surprisingly recovered, the first thing I did was grab the camera to transfer the video, hoping to be able to zoom in on the figure and finally see who or what it was. You can imagine my shock when the stranger was nowhere to be seen. I fast forwarded through the whole thing and he simply didn't appear on the video. Nearly five hours of footage of an empty street, that's what I watched baffled, I tried to explain my situation on the website and was met with general mockery. However, some of the members insisted I upload the file so they could search it themselves. For anomalies, they said. The results they posted later that evening were bizarre. It seemed that the man had indeed been caught by my camera, but only in a single frame. Somewhere around 3 hours, 22 minutes, and 50 seconds, a human-shaped shadow appeared near one of the streetlights, only to be gone in the next frame. Unnerved, I searched my own video to see if they were ribbing me. No. There it was, exactly 32251. The same blurry silhouette. What I did next, well, why it seemed like a good idea at the time, I'll never know. I guess it was because I was tired and angry at having my nights constantly interrupted. It was now clear this was no normal human being. Despite the warnings of the two or three geeks on the other side of the computer screen that made it sound so easy to deal with, suggesting that it would be better to just wait until the phenomenon subsided or simply move to another home, I decided to stay awake, keep watch outside, and confront the thing. This is precisely what I've been doing for the last two hours sitting here between the weeds and the bugs and writing this down to document my experience, but mostly to keep me busy until it comes, since I don't expect to be disturbed until our usual appointment. September 23rd, 2011, 322 AM. I really can't expect anyone to believe what just happened, but please, if you have listened this long, you might as well hear me out and at least take my advice and not follow my footsteps. I've messed up, badly, and now I may be about to pay the ultimate price for my recklessness. 
This waking nightmare has, has this time bonded me not to my bed, but to the horrors I just witnessed. To this moment that, that may well be my last, but I've got to calm down. I have to calm down and try to explain the best way I can what led me to my current situation. <sighs> Otherwise, all my efforts will have been in vain. As I said before, I was hiding on the side of my porch, waiting for the thing to make its move, checking my watch and fumbling with my dad's revolver. Now, I'm not the person who normally resorts to violence, and if I had my way, there would have been no firearms in my new house, but my father gave it to me and insisted I kept it, fearing for my safety while I was living alone in such an isolated area. I had just kept it in a box. Never once did it cross my mind that one day I would have to load it much less use it. My plan was simple. Follow the thing, find out what it was, and scare it away with a few gunshots. In hindsight, the plan was as stupid as they come, but sleep deprivation, outright anger and frustration coupled with the drinks I'd had in order to gain some courage all conspired to make it seem a reasonable idea. I started to regret my decision, however, the moment it appeared. Down at the far end of the street, the increasingly familiar black silhouette crept its way out of the shadows, starting its walk along the only path it had ever taken. I checked my clock, and sure enough, it was 3.22.51. I didn't know then, and I can't believe it now. Never mind. I'm getting ahead of myself. <sighs> the man, let's keep calling it that even if I'm still not sure painstakingly crept past the first few houses on my block, pausing frequently in front of a wooded gate here or holding onto a lamppost there. I checked again. 3.22.51. Hunched as usual, it crossed the street at a snail's pace, head bobbing as if looking around for cars that were nowhere to be seen. Coughing, the haggard figure stopped to hold onto a traffic light. I shivered when my watch reported back, 3.22.51. Down the road and a turn to the right in slow, heavy steps he shambled. I refused to believe it was still 3.22.51. All the bravado I had gathered from the day, internet and bottle drained away and I found myself skittering back to the front door, desperately trying to force it open so that I could retreat inside and hide in my room but the knob wouldn't budge. It was as though it had turned to stone. No matter how much strength I put into it, it remained in its original position as if paralyzed. The realization struck me like a sledgehammer. It wasn't just the doorknob. All around me, the usual autumn breezes were dead. Leaves were glued to the ground. Tree branches were as immobile as metal statues of themselves. In the sky, the moon shone steadily between the unmoving clouds, working together with the dim streetlights to cover the stranger in a sickly greenish glow. The form was still approaching and almost upon me. This close, I could see it more clearly. The dark, moth-eaten jacket and pants, the patches of gray, long, uneven hair crowning its features in shadow. But everything else about him seemed blurry as if coated in a sticky layer of darkness. I edged behind a fence and watched in horror as he passed the front of my house. He seemed to be barefoot and heading towards the dirt road that led to the nearby woods. Even though I was as terrified as I had ever been, I couldn't help it. Curiosity got the better of me. I followed the stranger as he shambled down the last of our street before heading into the wilderness. Half afraid he'd stop me and half even more afraid I could be stuck in this, I don't know what to call it, time freeze? The space between seconds? The moment before you start to inhale? Whatever it was, the being was certainly related to the paralytic phenomenon I'd been experiencing. And now I was in this parallel zone with the creature, whether I wanted to be or not. Together, we tiptoed past the empty houses, him leading the way without ever stopping, me pausing every once in a while to pat the reassuring weight of the revolver in my pocket. In this way, our two-man caravan abandoned civilization and plunged deep into the undergrowth. The hard, cold metal of the gun should have given me at least a small amount of confidence, but the truth is, 
I was scared shitless. Every time I'd feel a pebble under my shoe or a twig brush against my head, I'd hold my breath, praying that the thing I was following hadn't noticed. Sometimes it would stop, causing me to gag on a scream while I watched it stagger towards some nearby trunk to lean on for a moment, only to continue marching into the depths of the gnarled woods. That's when I noticed the silence. Following the being through the tangled and wiry bushes that littered the pathway should have made some noise. Instead, not a single leaf rustled, nor did the undergrowth crumple. While I had every reason to be extra cautious, my quarry didn't seem to bother at all and simply plowed through the foliage like a fog creeping in. He was silent too, and it wasn't just him. No, the wretched thing seemed to have contaminated the world all around us. No cricket, mosquito, or owl dared to break the stillness that froze the air. And I couldn't help but wonder if they were all paralyzed in their nests and burrows as I had been in my bed. A rank, putrid stench began to set in as we approached what I suspected to be the nearby swamp. I used to be able to hear the toads as I sat on my balcony during the calm summer nights. There was no croaking this time, but my suspicions as to our location were nevertheless confirmed. Beams of pale green light gleamed on the pools of muddy water, a dark mirror of browns and blacks that might as well have been made of dirty glass. The silence was deathly. No ripple, no frog, no gas bubble disturbed by the water's surface as the stranger stopped and sat at the muddy edge of a pool, almost as if contemplating the sight. His bare feet slumped into the mushy paste of the earth and dried algae without the slightest noise. Under the moonlight, I thought I would be able to see beneath all those baggy and rotten clothes if I snuck just a bit closer. Slowly, I approached the being from behind, half expecting to see toad-like hands and gills carved into its neck, like something out of H.P. Lovecraft tales I used to read in my freshman year. The truth was far simpler and more disturbing than that. I watched as it pulled one of its feet from the muck and water, and with it came the three remaining black and withered toes, the cracked, parchment-like skin peeking out from the muddy residue. I let out a gasp and staggered away in shock, trying to put as much distance as possible between me and that, that carcass of a man that I had watched walking down my street night after night. As I stared, unable to take my eyes from it, the rotten monstrosity turned its head to face me. It looked at me, with one eye hanging from its socket, its bloated face obscured by its matted hair. Its mouth opened and it gurgled at me, as though commanding my ears to hear his voice. Open wounds and exposed skull now visible and glistening at me under the moonlight sent the contents of my stomach back to my throat and filled my mouth with searing acid. Without a second glance, I darted off to the woods, spitting vomit as I ran and silently swearing as I slammed blindly against trunks and branches. The sharp iron-like limbs and leaves scraped against my face and I ducked my head to keep my eyes safe until I bumped into something heavy and wet and was knocked to the ground. Scrambling, I tried to scurry away from whatever I'd just run into, but my leg got caught on something and I panicked. It only took a moment to see the situation for what it really was. I wasn't caught. My leg was being pinned to the ground. I dropped the gun twice before finally being able to retrieve it and point it at whatever was holding me down. On the other side of my barrel's sight, I met the yellowish gaze of a woman hanging from a nearby tree, staring at me with bulging eyes covered by the same layer of pus and blood that enveloped the rest of her twitching body. A body just long enough for her feet to hold my legs down. All around in the depths of the small forest, I could see now that other things also crawled around things far too thin and ragged to be alive. The air was filled with the pungent stench of death. I had to get out of there. Gritting my teeth and rolling away from the thrashing legs of the corpse hanging over me, I held my gun close and rushed towards a dim yellow light I could barely see shining in the distance, ignoring the skinless fingers that dug through the undergrowth and the dripping entrails of another disturbing silhouette impaled on one of the higher branches. 
I emerged from the woods and found myself in an unfamiliar section of my suburb. The street lights brought yet more horrors, and I had to force myself to keep running. I darted past a man inside the metal cage of what had once been a totaled vehicle as he desperately tried to claw his way out of his final resting place. He banged on invisible glass and a non-existent metal frame while yelling to me to save him from the flames, throwing himself repeatedly against barriers that were no longer there. Though I tried, I could not avoid looking at his face and ran off, likewise pretending to ignore the jumbled mass of broken bones and leftover limbs twisted into impossible angles that inched sickeningly across the sidewalk. Others kept to the shadows, skulking on street corners or behind the veil of dark doorways, just far enough to be out of sight but close enough for me to hear the slowly increasing sound of footsteps all around me. I kept going, but to where was I running? Returning home was the first thing that came to my mind, but now I could see just how stupid the idea was. Even if I got there, what use would that be if the doors were still frozen? Until the paralysis caused by the apparent rift in space and time, if that was what it was, let up. There was no reason to try to find shelter indoors since I wouldn't be able to close the doors again on this unholy mass. Unless... The church! I was never a superstitious man, but then I hadn't met any walking corpses before, and from some of the tales I'd read, I remembered that the living dead couldn't walk on holy ground, and that would include everything within the high iron fences surrounding the little parish church, right? Anyway, it, it was better than doing nothing. At the very least, I could buy myself some time to plan my next step. Shadows shuffled in my peripheral vision as I made it across the second intersection, stopping to take a glance inside one of the few cars parked outdoors in the irrational hope that owners could have left the key inside and that I could open the door and start it, but the glass only reflected a vision of hell. Looming behind me were dozens of rotting heads staring with unblinking eyes, their mouths agape. Without turning back, I jolted left, only to come face to face with a man in a blood-smeared jacket who looked at me with an almost childlike expression on his ruined face. Without a single thought, I jumped on top of the vehicle, grateful that the windshield held, and cursed myself for having wasted my time. I would have never been able to break in anyway. Leaping off the car's hood and racing towards the final intersection that stood between me and Sanctuary, my heart pounded in my chest as the ghostly crowd took up the chase, the thumping of their feet ever closer, following my own inaudible footsteps. As I turned right, despair overwhelmed me. The far end of the road just before the church vomited a new crawling mass at me, effectively cutting off my best route. With the first horde still hot on my heels, I had no choice but to continue forward, towards the shambling army that awaited me, or so they hoped. A front yard came into view, which, like the churchyard, was circled by an iron fence topped with spikes. I didn't hesitate to try and climb it. Corpses weren't known for their agility, but unfortunately, neither was I, and I managed only to fall flat on the ground when my grip slipped. Before I could get up, a horrible pain shot through my legs as if icicles had punctured them, and before I could kick away, more ice-cold vices gripped my right arm. Rolling my head to see what had me trapped, I witnessed the moving face of a woman, with no lips nor gums left in her jaws whispering at me. She dug her cold, wet fingers into my neck. I tried to punch and kick, but could barely move as more and more bony arms pinned my legs and body to the concrete. I still had one hand free and used it to do what any sane man would have done long ago. I raised my gun. Instantly, some of my assailants backed away, one of them clutching the dry and visible holes in his chest as he did so and I seized the moment to kick myself free of the last of them and unload the revolver, hoping at least the noise and light would scare them away. The gun spurred in only dead air as I felt it ineffectively click through all six of its loaded chambers. 
I dropped the useless piece of metal as I flung myself again at the fence, this time managing to get to the top unharmed, while the ragged crowd recovered from its confusion and their low gurgles gave way to snarls as they came at me again. Dropping down into the safety of the protected yard, I ran as fast as I could around the side of the backyard and dashed over a much smaller wooded fence just in time to hear my pursuers starting to spill over the porch. Though I was exhausted like I'd never been before, my inner strength was relit by hope. I could see the light of the church. I headed straight for the hill and got back on the main road, ignoring the constant ache of my legs where the icy claws had dug into flesh. The church rose on the horizon and I took one last glimpse back to see the undead horde still struggling to free themselves from the obstacle which I'd led them. Many were stuck half in and half out of the iron fence, with a few stuck up on the upper spikes and no way to catch up to me now. This was it. I knew I could make it. The church was just ahead now, and I could see the lights were on inside. And there were people there, others who had taken shelter beyond the churchyard fence, in the light of the sanctuary. I was right, and now everything was going to be okay. I pressed on, telling myself the way the parishioners leaned as they walked was probably because they were as tired as I, caught in the dead of night by this invasion from beyond. I ran, even while trying to convince myself that the gruesome injuries I started to see even from this distance were sustained in their own fights to get into the church. I forced my legs to keep moving while weakly holding out hope that I wasn't alone and had finally found help. But when the headstones of the churchyard cemetery came into view beyond the fence, and with them the scrawny, wraith-like shadows that scurried amongst the tombs, I realized I couldn't keep lying to myself. I hide now in this hollow, having run what I hope to be enough of a distance to put me out of their range, and wonder how long it will take until these things depart, if they ever depart. In the now distant town, the ghouls continue to come and go, occasionally sticking their heads up or sniffing the air. It has been 3 hours, 22 minutes, and 51 seconds for a long while now, just as it was when I began to write my story. I want, no, I need to get the word out, where even though it may not be believed, it will at least be heard and serve as a warning. There are things that go bump in the night, and there is a real risk of venturing too deep into the abyss to be able to return to life. If you wake up paralyzed in the middle of the night, Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications.